Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. Context of white supremacy, justice, Gus T. Renegade. In for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, October 18th, 2013. So I have been told I uh, want to get right to it. Uh, as I said, we are nearing the end uh, of the book. Uh, Norman would start off with an intro from the author Isabel Wilkerson, but we've heard from her 12 times already. <laughs> we will get right to it. Plus, I did have one bit of information I wanted to share. Uh, Farmer Trav, one of our longtime uh, listeners, investors in the program, did some research uh, based on the book and our study sessions with the warmth of other sons. And he recalled that Dr. Robert Pershing Foster, uh, when he first got to California, just trying to make a little bit of change. He worked for Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, and he did some research, and he found that they have a long history of fighting against racism, white supremacy, being terrorized, and this is ongoing. Uh, you can check out the website, the William Nickerson Jr. Project.com. No spaces. Uh, it's www.williamnickerson.com. Junior Jr. Project.com. And I'm just reading one of the posts by Kim Nickerson. William Nickerson Jr. was a pioneer and entrepreneur of black business in Los Angeles and an enthusiastic visionary, a humanitarian, and motivator to many African Americans. He was the founder and first president of Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company the first African-American life insurance company on the West Coast and the largest African-American life insurance company in the state of California. William Nickerson Jr. was born on a farm in San Jacinto County, Texas on January 26, 1879 to William Nickerson Sr. and Emma Poole. His father and mother were born into slavery. Nickerson was the only son and had three sisters. As a boy, he worked on the farm, raising cattle, chickens, and geese, planting and harvesting corn, cotton, and sugar cane, except during the five months of the year when he would walk four miles over rough roads to school. He loved to read and would read long into the night by the light of a kerosene lamp. After graduating from high school, Nickerson entered Bishop College in Marshall, Texas, where he studied economics. Later, he received a teacher's certificate from a Prairie View College in Prairie View, Texas. With his certification, Nickerson taught public school in San Jacinto County for four years. In 1905, Nickerson went to work as an underwriter for Southern Mutual Benefit Association, a white insurance company in Dallas. He married Bertha B. Benton of Carthage, Texas in 1906. Nickerson and his wife, had eight children. Nickerson soon left the school because of discrimination toward black teachers. He was underpaid and could not support his family. In 1908, he organized American Mutual Benefit Association of Houston, Texas. With Nickerson's hard work and determination, American Mutual grew and became known throughout the states as the most outstanding Negro business west of Chicago. In Houston, Texas, in the early 1900s, there was only one black-owned newspaper. Enterprising Nickerson saw a need and believed that black people should have more than one voice in the publishing world. In 1916, he started the Houston Observer and later, along with Clifton F. Richardson and H. F. Edwards, organized the Informer Publishing Company to publish the Houston Informer in 1919. After the Houston riots and World War I, Nickerson, a political activist, targeted the Democratic primary system and brought suit against the Democratic Party functionary to permit black people the right to vote in May of 1921. Soon after, Nickerson's phone rang. 
It was the voice of a man who said, Nickerson, you and some other niggers dare to sue white people. We understand that you are one of the leaders. Tonight we are coming to get you. Nickerson informed his friends and they prepared with rifles and guns in hand as they waited all night, but no one ever came. Mrs. Nickerson begged her husband, let's leave Texas, saying, take us to California. I would rather eat bread and drink water in a distant land and have peace than be in a land like this where there is utter confusion and constant fear of violence. On June 11, 1921, Nickerson, his wife, and eight children traveled by South Pacific Railway to California. They arrived in Los Angeles on June 13, 1921. The next year, Nickerson organized a branch of American Mutual Benefit Association. Under Nickerson's management, the branch prospered. He recognized a need for life insurance company owned and controlled by black people in California. In 1925, he founded Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company. With humble beginnings, he started the company in a small one-room office at 1435 Central Avenue. Golden State Mutual received its first charter on July 23, 1925, and immediately began offering life, endowment, health, and accident insurance to the community regardless of race or color. Among the original officers of Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company were William Nickerson, Jr., President, George A. Beavers, Jr., Vice President, and Norman O. Houston, Secretary, Treasurer. In the 1930s, convincing black Americans to buy life insurance in the time of a depressed economy was not an easy task. When Nickerson needed to recruit agents to the company, Nickerson used various methods to gain new agents. He often used animal parables. His favorite was The Little Black Hen, a story of perseverance. Nickerson would confidently stand on desks, chairs, and sometimes even tabletops to gain attention, persuade, and motivate. In 1939, Nickerson returned to Bishop College to receive an honorary degree in the field of business. In 1949, the famous African-American architect Paul Williams designed the strikingly beautiful landmark we know today as the home office located on Western Avenue and Adams Boulevard in Los Angeles. Congressman Maxine Waters, speaking at the 60th anniversary celebration of Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, said that Golden State is a shining example of true economic development in our community. In 1955, the Nickerson Gardens housing development in Watts, 1,056 housing units built on 68 acres, was dedicated to Nickerson's lifetime achievements. The project served as a model for housing projects throughout the United States. William Nickerson Jr. died in 1945 at the age of 66. In addition to heart complications, Nickerson had contracted pneumonia. Dearly loved by his family, business associates, and employees, Los Angeles mourned. Uh, Again, Kim Nickerson wrote this. Uh, She is the youngest grandchild of William Nickerson Jr., an actress and poet, and an 1985 UCLA graduate. Uh, She currently works in Los Angeles as a special education substitute teacher. Uh, You can read more going to the William Nickerson Jr. Project. Uh, They give more details about the racism that Golden State Mutual experience and current racism, white supremacy that they are experiencing and trying to maintain the legacy of all Mr. Nickerson's hard work. Uh, But thought that would be great to add to our study. I want to get right to it. Closing in on the conclusion of the book, again, Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration. Study session number 13, audio segment number one. The fullness of the migration. And so the root becomes a trunk, and then a tree, and seeds of trees, and springtime sap, and summer shade, and autumn leaves, and shape of poems and dreams, and more than tree. Langston Hughes. The North and West. 1970. This was the year that demographers called the turning point in the exodus of black Americans out of the South. 
It was the year that the revolutions of the 1960s began to bear fruit, and black children were entering white schools in the South without death threats or the need for the National Guard. The people from the South continued to go north in great waves because nobody told them the migration was over, but fewer were leaving than in previous decades, and nearly as many blacks in the North and West, particularly the children of the original people of the Great Migration, began to contemplate or act upon a desire to return south, now that things appeared to be changing. Ida May, the sharecropper's wife from Chickasaw County, Mississippi, was not among them. She was like the majority of the original migrants, people who were not really migrants at all, but who had left for good and didn't look back. She was 57 years old now, a grandmother, and had been in Chicago for more than half her life. The elevated train, the three feet of snow falling in April when it had no business falling, the all-white neighborhood that had turned black in an eye blink, it was all part of her now. Her life revolved around family, church, and work, really no different than the order of things would have been in Mississippi, except that the city that brought freedom also brought unforeseen hazards and heartbreak. She had gotten used to the concrete and congestion, the press of buildings in place of the expansive field. She had learned to quicken her step as she walked to or from work, but she still smiled at people on the bus or reached out to help young mothers balancing babies in strollers. She was even getting to know the gangbangers who had begun to position themselves on the street corners to establish their turf and organize their drug inventory. She spoke to them, and they spoke back to her, calling her grandma and watching out for her to the dismay of her own children, whose objections she largely ignored because the gangbangers and their little lookouts were God's children too to her way of thinking. She was in the city, but not fully wise to it, nor seeking to be. One day, coming home from work, she stepped off the curb at the green light for pedestrians to cross 87th Street at the Dan Ryan Expressway. The right turn on red had just been made legal. A man in a late-model sedan pulled out in front of the bus just as she was trying to cross. She fell onto the hood and then tumbled to the concrete. That was a good fall, she said. She was sore, but not much else. The man who hit her was worried for her and drove her to Jackson Park Hospital, where she was declared fine, save for a few bruises to her arms, legs, and ego. They called her husband to tell him what had happened. Oh, he fussed, she said, which looked to be the only way he knew to show he cared. You should have watched where you were going, he told her when she got home. The idea of losing Ida May seemed to incite as much anger as worry in him. There was already a sense of lingering sadness in the house. Their beloved Velma, the little girl Ida May hadn't wanted at first, but whom she had held close and cherished, and who had ridden next to her along with little James on the train ride north, was gone now. There had been a car accident a few years before. The details of the crash somehow didn't matter so much in the eternity between getting the call and making it to the hospital. Ida May saw her firstborn trying to hold on to life and then slip away. Ida May almost fell apart. Decades later, it would be the one thing she rarely talked about, as if not talking about it made it less real. And even though she knew full well that it was, she couldn't bear to let the thought of it slip into her subconscious. She acted as if it had never happened, and if it came up, her voice went uncharacteristically flat, and she quickly found something else to talk about. The police, she would say. They was riding last night. Ida May and her husband had settled into whatever they were going to be in the North. They were blue-collar, church-going, tax-paying homeowners, with now two instead of three grown children. Ida May now had six little grandchildren, all of whom had been born within the bonds of holy matrimony, even though Eleanor's didn't manage to last, which perfectly reflected the demographics of the times. Ida May's husband was a deacon in the church, whose pastime was cheering the White Sox on television with their grandson Kevin and instructing him on the strategies of the game. Ida May and her husband were never going to go to college or rise much beyond where they were, but they had come a long way from where they had started, and that was an accomplishment in itself. 
Many years later, people would forget about the quiet successes of everyday people like Ida May. In the debates to come over welfare and pathology, America would overlook people like her in its fixation with the underclass, just as a teacher can get distracted by the two or three problem children at the expense of the quiet, obedient ones. Few experts trained their sights on the unseen masses of migrants like her, who worked from the moment they arrived, didn't end up on welfare, stayed married because that's what God-fearing people of their generation did, whether they were happy or not, and managed not to get strung out on drugs or whiskey or a cast of nameless, no-count men. There were two sets of similar people arriving in Chicago and other industrial cities of the North at around the same time in the early decades of the 20th century. Blacks pouring in from the South and immigrants arriving from Eastern and Southern Europe in a slowing but continuous stream from across the Atlantic, a pilgrimage that had begun in the latter part of the 19th century. On the face of it, they were sociologically alike, mostly landless rural people put upon by the landed upper classes or harsh autocratic regimes seeking freedom and autonomy in the northern factory cities of the United States. But as they made their way into the economies of Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, and other receiving cities, their fortunes diverged. Both groups found themselves ridiculed for their folkways and accents and suffered backward assumptions about their abilities and intelligence. But with the stroke of a pen, many Eastern and Southern Europeans and their children could wipe away their ethnicities and those limiting assumptions by adopting Anglo-Saxon surnames and melting into the world of the more privileged native-born whites. In this way, generations of immigrant children could take their places without the burdens of an outsider ethnicity in a less enlightened era. Doris von Koppelhoff could become Doris Day and Isur Danielovich, the son of immigrants from Belarus, could become Kirk Douglas, meaning that his son could live life and pursue stardom as Michael Douglas, instead of as Michael Danielovich. A name change would have no effect in masking the ethnicity of black migrants like Ida Mae, George, and Robert. It would have been superfluous, given that their surnames, often inherited from the masters of their forebears, were already Anglo-Saxon, they did not have the option of choosing for themselves a more favored identity. They could not easily assimilate whether they sought to or not. They could send their children to northern schools that were superior to anything back south, acquire a northern accent, save up for suits to replace the overalls and croker sack dresses of the field, but they would never be mistaken for an English or Welsh arriviste, the way a Czech or Hungarian immigrant could if so inclined. Black migrants did not have the same shot at craft unions or foreman jobs or country clubs or exclusive cul-de-sac lace-curtain neighborhoods that other immigrants could enter if they were of a mind to do so. A daughter of white ethnics could instantly escape the perceived disadvantages of her origins by marrying a man of northern or western European descent and taking his surname. She and whatever children she bore could thus assume the identity of a more privileged caste. With the exception of extraordinarily light-skinned blacks passing over into the white world for these very same privileges, the daughter of the average black migrants would gain no such advantage by intermarrying. She would still be seen as black and be subject to the scrutiny of the outside world, no matter whom she married or whose name she took. Even without trying to pass oneself off as anything other than what he or she was, an ethnic immigrant would not likely be distinguishable from any other white person boarding a train, lining up for a foreman's job, or waiting for a loan officer at a bank. Public situations that opened black migrants to immediate rejection, but that white ethnic immigrants were protected from by virtue of their skin color. Ultimately, according to the Harvard immigration scholar Stanley Lieberson, a major difference between the acceptance and thus life outcomes of black migrants from the South and their white immigrant counterparts was this. White immigrants and their descendants 
could escape the disadvantages of their station if they chose to, while that option did not hold for the vast majority of black migrants and their children. The ethnicity of the descendants of white immigrants was more a matter of choice because with some effort it could be changed, Lieberson wrote, and out in public might not easily be determined at all. The hierarchy in the North called for blacks to remain in their station, Lieberson wrote, while immigrants were rewarded for their ability to leave their old world traits and become American as quickly as possible. Society urged them to leave Poland and Latvia behind and enter the mainstream white world. Not so with their black counterparts like Ida May, Robert, and George. Although many blacks sought initially to reach an assimilated position in the same way as did the new European immigrants, Lieberson noted, the former's efforts were apt to be interpreted as getting out of their place or were likely to be viewed with mockery. Ambitious black migrants found that they were not able to get ahead just by following the course taken by immigrants and had to find other routes to survival and hoped for success. Contrary to common assumptions about childbearing and welfare, many black migrants compensated for the disadvantages they faced by cutting back in every way they could, most notably by having fewer children than the Eastern and Southern Europeans arriving at the same time. Ida May, for example, bore no more children after the one she carried in her belly from Mississippi at the age of 25, despite the many fertile years she spent in the North. She and her husband could not afford another mouth to feed. It turned out that during the first three decades of the Great Migration, fertility rates for black women migrants from the South were actually among the lowest of all newer arrivals to the North, according to Lieberson's compilation of census data. In 1940, for the 15 to 34 age group, Ida Mays at the time, there were 916 children per thousand black women as against 951 for Austrians, 1,030 for Russians, 1,031 for Poles, 1,176 for Hungarians, and 1,388 for Italians. Czech women were virtually tied with black women at 923 children per thousand women. The disparities only widened with age. Among those in the 45 to 54 age group, Central and Eastern European immigrant women had borne, in some cases, twice as many children per thousand as black migrant women in the North in 1940, with the Russians having borne 3,111, the Hungarians 3,305, the Austrians 3,683, the Czechs 4,045, the Poles 4,192, and the Italians, 4,638, compared to 2,219 children having been born to black women by the same point in their lives in the North. Clyde Vernon Kaiser, a political scientist at Columbia University studying the black migration from South Georgia to the Northeast in the 1930s, also found fertility to be significantly reduced by migration among black couples who went to both New York and Boston. The differences in most cases are of a massive nature, Lieberson reported. Blacks, though native-born, were arriving as the poorest people from the poorest section of the country with the least access to the worst education. Over the decades of the migration, they came with every disadvantage and found themselves competing not only with newcomers like themselves, but with second- and third-generation European immigrants already established in apprenticeships and factory jobs that were closed off to black migrants, the immigrants and their children permitted into the very trade unions that prohibited black citizens from joining. Because they were largely excluded from well-paying positions and even unskilled occupations and were concentrated in servant work and other undesirable jobs, Blacks were the lowest paid of all the recent arrivals. In 1950, blacks in the North and West made a median annual income of $1,628.
compared to Italian immigrants, who made $2,295, Czechs, who made $2,339, Poles, who made $2,419, and Russians, who made $2,717. There is just no avoiding the fact that blacks were more severely discriminated against in the labor market and elsewhere, Lieberson wrote. They had to work more hours to earn less money than anyone else, the historian Gilbert Osofsky wrote. The people of the Great Migration had farther to climb because they started off at the lowest rung wherever they went. They incited greater fear and resentment, in part because there was no ocean between them and the North, as there was with many other immigrant groups. There was no way to stem the flow of blacks from the South, as the authorities could and did by blocking immigration from China and Japan, for instance. Thus, blacks confronted hostilities more severe than most any other group, except perhaps Mexicans, who could also cross over by land, as it could not be known how many thousands more might come and pose a further threat to the pre-existing world of the North. The presence of so many black migrants elevated the status of other immigrants in the North and West. Black Southerners stepped into a hierarchy that assigned them a station beneath everyone else, no matter that their families had been in the country for centuries. Their arrival unwittingly diverted anti-immigrant antagonisms their way, as they were an even less favored outsider group than the immigrants they encountered in the North and helped make formerly ridiculed groups more acceptable by comparison. Ida May was so isolated, living as she was in the all-black neighborhood of South Shore, that she had little contact with other immigrant groups, except perhaps at work. She tried to make the best of it, since she had no control over who had gotten to Chicago before she did, or how they lived or what they thought of her. Her world was small, purposely so, built around her family and the people she knew from back home in Mississippi, and that was the way she and her husband preferred it. New York, 1970. George Swanson Starling. This is what George Starling's life had become at its midpoint. He had made it up north all right, as he had dreamed so long ago. But he had an unhappy wife who could not be made happy, and two teenage children who were good at heart, but had been swallowed up by the worst aspects of the North and South, while he and his wife were out working long hours to give the kids a life they themselves had never had. He had a two-year-old by another woman that he had to support, and a decent-paying but dead-end job as essentially a servant to railroad passengers, needing help with their luggage, directions to their seats, another pillow, their shoes shined. He turned fifty-two in 1970. He had been in the North for a quarter of a century. He would never be the chemist or accountant he had seen for himself in his mind, would never work a white-collar job, or any kind of job that would make use of his intellect. And, by an accident of birth, he had managed to suffer the terror and injustice of Jim Crow, but just missed the revolution that opened up the best in education and unheard-of career opportunities for black people with the passage of the civil rights laws of the 1960s. The revolution had come too late for him. He was in his mid-forties when the Civil Rights Act was signed, and close to fifty when its effects were truly felt. He did not begrudge the younger generation their opportunities. He only wished that more of them, his own children in particular, recognized their good fortune, the price that had been paid for it, and made the most of it. He was proud to have lived to see the change take place. He wasn't judging anyone, and accepted the fact that history had come too late for him to make much use of all the things that were now opening up. But he couldn't understand why some of the young people couldn't see it. Maybe you had to live through the worst of times to recognize the best of times when they came to you. Maybe that was just the way it was with people. He did not dwell on this long or let it get him down. He stood as straight-backed now as he had when the South told him he didn't have a right to. He started going to church and found solace in that. He started singing in the choir. He had a way of sitting back and shaking his head at absurdities, 
whether segregationists training their terriers to mock black people in the South, or black people with no hope or home training shooting each other over a nickel bag in the North. The young people were letting their hair grow out and wearing afros that his generation would never have been seen out in public with. They were living together, shacking up, they called it, in a flouting kind of way that even now, tortured as his marriage was, he couldn't bring himself to do. They were taking things farther than he ever would have had the nerve to contemplate, preaching black power, calling the white man a devil, walking arm in arm down the street with white women, all of those things that would have gotten him killed when he was their age. The young people picked up on something strong and unnameable in him. They never bothered him as he climbed the stairs out of his basement apartment with his creaky and now arthritic knees, heading to work at Pennsylvania Station or returning late at night from a 48-hour run. He knew more than most people of his generation precisely what he had missed out on and what his life could have been. He had had a taste of college, knew he could do the work, and was convinced he could have succeeded. How complicated had the ending of his college career been? Looking back on it, the course of his life had turned on that moment. He would not have been working in the citrus groves, or had the standoff with the grove owners that had forced him to flee to the north if he had stayed in school. That moment would gnaw at him for as long as he lived. What if his father hadn't gotten it into his head that George had had enough schooling? If his father had helped out with the tuition George needed? If his father hadn't had a new family to support and chosen that obligation over college for his son? Then there was segregation. What if colored students had been allowed to attend the state schools near Eustis in George's day, as they could after the Civil Rights Movement, where it would have been easier for George to make a go of it, work and go part-time if he had to. Then there was George himself. At midlife, George had to search his soul and live with the regrets of his own missteps. If only he hadn't rushed to get back at his father by marrying a woman from the other side of the tracks, giving his father further reason to withhold his support, and leaving George with a wife to take care of besides— Perhaps he would have gotten the education that would have allowed him to fulfill his potential. As it was, he had only to look at Inez to be reminded of what could have been. It was spite, George would say of the decisions he made at that moment in his life. He took every chance he got to warn young people not to make his mistakes, not knowing if they heard him, but feeling he had to get it out. That's why I preach today, do not do spite, he said. Spite does not pay. It goes around and misses the object that you aim and comes back and zaps you. And you're the one who pays for it. Los Angeles, 1970. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. On Christmas Day, 1970, Robert P. Foster turned 52 years old. He had been in Los Angeles for 17 years, but for some reason he was unable to fill up on what he had acquired any more than he could carry fog in his satchel. He had a practice that minted money. With all those migrants from Texas and Louisiana, he had patients spilling out of his office and into the hall, sitting like refugees on the floor all day, waiting for him to check their blood pressure, by then, he found it hard to walk down a hospital ward without orderlies and scrub nurses hailing him from closing elevator doors. Hey, Doc, remember me? From some long-ago operation. And his feigning recollection so as not to disappoint them. He was comfortably situated. There was the well-born wife, the three beautiful daughters, and the 3,600-square-foot house west of Crenshaw, if only by a block, with the white Cadillac in the driveway. He was famous, even. Ray Charles's song about him, Hide Nor Hair, spent seven weeks on the Billboard charts back in 1962. But he woke up that morning with the feeling that nothing mattered but the events that were about to unfold that day. Until this moment, he had lived his life with the perpetual sense of watching a reception through a keyhole, 
of arriving too late and without the proper documentation. There he would be at the front gate, all dressed and superior to the people inside, but afraid of being denied admittance. He craved acceptance from those most determined to withhold it from him, and met slights and rejections at nearly every turn. The small-minded people in that Jim Crow town, Rufus and Pearl Clement scrutinizing his every move since the day he married Alice, the colonel from Mississippi who wouldn't let him operate on white women, the motel clerks in Phoenix who denied him a room, the colored people who happened to have gotten to L.A. first and wouldn't lend a newcomer a hand, that hotel in Vegas. After all this time, he still couldn't shake these things. Rufus Clement had been dead for years. The run-in with the motel clerks in Phoenix, that was seventeen years ago. The colonel, farther back than that. All the good and extraordinary things that had happened to him seemed never to make up for the rejection he had endured, and he set out to prove that he was better than what they took him for, even though the people who haunted him would never see it, no matter what he did. Because of the fifty-one previous years of his life, he had a number of complexes. He had a Napoleon complex, a Southern complex, a baby of the family complex. He had both a superiority complex and an inferiority complex, and because he was born on Christmas Day, a Christmas baby complex. He had never had much of a birthday party, a fate known to just about anyone who enters the world on Christmas. His mother had tried to give him a birthday party once when he was a young boy in Monroe. She invited all the children in Newtown. Only four came. That would not happen this time. He finally had all the pieces in place to celebrate his having arrived. In a few hours, he would give a gala in honor of himself. It would make up for all the parties he'd never had, all the slights he had ever suffered. It would prove to everyone that he had put Monroe in the South behind him and made it in L.A. He had worked it all out in his head. He would have guests from back east and up the coast and from all over the country. Monroe, too, of course. The best hams and the finest heavy bond paper for the invitations. Anything that anyone had ever thought of for a party, he would have. It would cost in the thousands, like the major motion picture rap parties over in Beverly Hills, and he wanted the guests to see every dime of it. He had rehearsed the whole thing in his mind. That morning he woke up early, just like when he was a teenager back in Monroe, racing to lose himself in the celluloid illusion of California sophisticates from the colored balcony of the Paramount. Now he was in California, finally a sophisticate himself, and the urine-scented steps of the Paramount were from another lifetime. But as he rewound a tape that had yet to be recorded, a thunderstorm gathered in his stomach. He could hear the sounds of a party forming on the first floor, footsteps on linoleum, the help skittering between the refrigerator and the sink and around the avocado green Formica Island back to the refrigerator again, the low screech of high chairs being positioned at the bar, the setting down of serving pieces and highball glasses, the opening and closing of the heavy front door with the arrival of roses and ice. He had done all he could, and now it was up to the workers, who sweet though they might be, could not possibly understand how crucial it was that there be only cashews and almonds, and for God's sake, no peanuts in the nut bowls. The sound of urgent disorder rose up the staircase and into his room. Rather than being pleased that all was going more or less according to plan, he was sickened at the prospect that, for all his preparation, things might be less than perfect. He could hear the assembling of a party, the storm grew worse in his stomach. For most of 1970, Robert had devoted himself to the second job of planning his own arrival party. He had told his wife Alice and daughter Joy and his mother-in-law Pearl as soon as the thought had occurred to him. He told Bunny and Robin in Chicago to be in Los Angeles that Christmas and sent them checks for their gowns with instructions to start shopping immediately.
He told his nephew Madison, a graduate student at the University of Michigan, that he expected him in from Ann Arbor. He told Madison's mother, Harriet, that he wanted her in from Monroe. He alerted the members of his wedding party, the former groomsmen in black tails and white kid gloves, and the bridesmaids with tiaras planted over their Betty Davis curls, so they could mark Friday, December 25th, 1970, on their calendars. Leo the maitre d' at Les Coffiers, a French restaurant at the Beverly Hilton, would oversee the whole affair. The date fell within weeks of Alice's 50th birthday, as well as Bunny's and Gold's birthdays. But the party would be essentially for him. Robert began devising the guest list as if it were a state dinner. He began thinking menu and decor, a tent over the patio, Belgian lace for the tablecloths, open bar with unpronounceable top-shelf spirits. He slept with the thought of it. He carried it in his head to work. During breaks in the day, he would think aloud to a nurse about this or that entree or particular band, not necessarily because he wanted a second opinion. He would not have turned to them for that, but because he assumed everyone was as captivated as he was. In fact, some were. At the office one day, a patient overheard him buzzing about the party. The patient joined in and offered to help. He said he did a little printing work and could make Doc Foster some nice invitations for the party. Robert was horrified at the notion and thought it should be obvious that no ordinary printer would do for a party of this caliber. Thank you very much, Robert said, but they're already taken care of. In truth, he had not begun looking, but he was grateful for the reminder and would track down an engraver immediately. It had to be the best person in the city, he would say years later, and I knew the best couldn't be a patient of mine. He dispatched his mother-in-law to get on it right away. Her southern socialite airs would come in handy about now. It would give her something to occupy her mind, and less time to scrutinize him. She spent an entire month choosing between white and ecru and the proper weight for the cardstock. They found the invitations at the old Bullock's Wilshire in Beverly Hills, off Rodeo Drive. They had them engraved on Crane's paper, white with red lettering and a red border along the edge. Etiquettely, he said, it was perfect. The invitations read, Dr. and Mrs. Robert P. Foster, at home, Friday the 25th of December, at 9 o'clock in the evening, 1680 Victoria Avenue. Regrets only, cocktails, dancing. Two hundred invitations went out, and as Robert was at the peak of his practice and popularity, one hundred ninety-four accepted. We counted all but six RSVPs, he said, and the six that declined were all out of town. That raised the stakes for everything else, beginning with the costumes for the principals. He was the star and would have to look it. He went to the Beverly Hills Couturiers, the tailors to Sammy Davis, Jr., who from across a blackjack table some people said he favored, and found a suit to his liking. Crushed Velvet had just hit the scene, very fifth dimension, age of Aquarius and all that. So that's what he would wear. Black crushed velvet suit, black crushed velvet bow tie, black velvet ballet slippers with a gold medallion above the instep. The suit had a red lining to match the red silk handkerchief in his breast pocket, and the shirt cuff fell precisely one inch below the jacket sleeve, just as it should. Finding something for Alice would take more time. He was the show-off, just waiting for somebody to say, Bob Foster, you too much. They went all over Beverly Hills, to the back rooms of the designer floors of the finest department stores, Robert watching, advising, critiquing, and for one reason or another dismissing and rejecting as Alice tried on hanger after hanger of dresses. One night after work, rather than heading straight home or to the track, Robert drove north and west from his medical office toward Beverly Hills. He went directly to the French room at Bullock's Wilshire, which he had been known to keep open in search of the right attire. They had been there already, but he wanted to check again. This time he saw an organza gown loaded with beadwork. It was gaudy, like New Orleans, and the skirt looked as if somebody had thrown rubies on the sidewalk. Robert told the sales clerk to wrap it up immediately. 
he carried it home and ran up the steps to show Alice. It was late and he woke her up. Try it on, baby, he said. She got up and he positioned himself three feet to the right and rear in a corner of the yellow-trimmed bedroom to watch her move in it. Walk, turn, come to me. It became alive when she walked, he said. In Ann Arbor, his nephew Madison awaited word on the big party between sociology colloquia and trying to take over the administration building at the University of Michigan. He was a three-piece suited militant who knew how to use a fish fork. Robert had given him a year's notice about the party. All year long, if the phone rang and it was Robert, he knew what it was about. I'm having Mrs. Williams roast the nuts for the party. Hampton Hawes has agreed to do the jazz set. I'm flying the Smithfield hams in from Virginia. From the moment they accepted, he and the 194 other people on the guest list, and the guests they were bringing with them, were on a low-grade state of alert whether they liked it or not. Anyone deemed close enough to be invited also knew that Robert would expect them to look and act the part he assigned them. He wanted them to have a good time, of course, but he would also be sure to make note of the cut of their jackets and where a dress hem fell in relation to the ankle or knee. He would be judging them all. It was just how he was, and he couldn't help it. Madison felt the heat as much as anyone. He was the only child of Robert's deceased oldest brother. Theirs was the closest that either had to a father-son relationship. They were the only foster men left after all the deaths in the family. Big Madison, when he was alive, had made a point of not leaving the South, not running away and chasing a dream as Robert and millions of others had done, but staying and making the most of the angst and subtle shifts in sentiment of Southern whites, watching their meal ticket disappear on north and west-bound trains. Little Madison had thus been raised in the South, with the pride and insecurities that came with it, and despite his father's decision to stay, looked up to his Uncle Robert, who had made good out West. A visit from Robert was a cause of great anxiety. Robert once visited Michigan in the mid-sixties. Madison did his best to impress him. He took him to the fanciest place he could afford. It took some time for the guests to figure out what they wanted from the menu, but they ordered and had a fine time. On the ride back, Robert gave his assessment of the evening. That was B+, plus, he said. Madison sank into his seat and waited to hear what he had missed. You shouldn't have let your guests struggle with the menu, Robert told him. Madison never really got over it. Almost forty years later, and he was still second-guessing the evening. I didn't pre-order the food, he would say long afterward. It was a painful lesson. I learned it. He was Southern and did everything he could to prove himself. He tried to pull Robert's daughters back to their Louisiana roots, but they looked upon him as their country cousin from back in Monroe, a place they cared little about, growing up as they did in California. Madison was a graduate student when Robert's oldest daughter, Bunny, got her master's at the University of Iowa. He didn't have the money for a new suit. He flew in anyway. At the commencement, Robert pulled him aside. Your suit pants are shiny, Robert said. You shouldn't go out like that. Madison would not let that happen again. He had a year's notice on the party and made use of it. He went to a tailor and had two suits cut for the occasion, hoping that one of them might meet Robert's exacting standards. December 25th, 1970, a Friday. The florists draped pine-leaf garlands down the railing of the front staircase. To the branches they fastened red plastic birds with glitter on the wingtips, so that every four feet there was a little bird in flight. The caterers moved the dining room table in front of the gold draperies. They covered it with $250 worth of white Belgian lace and set sterling candelabras on each end, as the Clements would have done. The Smithfield hams arrived from Virginia. The shrimp gumbo was set out with instructions that it never hit empty. The barkeep lined the liquor bottles behind the highball glasses at the bar. 
I told the bartender to give everybody two shots, whether they wanted it or not, Robert said. All day, the heavy front door opened and closed with the arrival of supplies, and the telephone rang on and off, people just landing at LAX, people needing directions. Dusk fell, and the time drew near. Robert began to feel sick. The thunderstorm grew worse in his stomach. He felt weak and exhausted. His knees gave way. He fell back, collapsed. He had to be helped upstairs, lie down, gather himself. He lay there staring at the yellow walls in the master bedroom, fretting and unable to face the possibility of imperfection. He closed his eyes. He tried to rest. Soon, outside his window, he could hear the rumble of car engines rounding St. Charles Place and turning up South Victoria. The screeching came to a stop, the creak of the passenger door of a Cadillac opening and the thud of its closing, the engine shutting down and the valet taking the keys. The first guests had arrived and were walking down the red-carpeted sidewalk he conceived of months ago. Round the corner and down the stairs, he could hear muffled conversation, a party being born. He reminded himself why he had spent the better part of a year and really all of his life planning for this moment. He got up, steadied himself. He checked himself in the mirror, practiced his smile, and straightened his crushed velvet tie. Let's get on with it, he said to himself, liking what he saw. It's on. He is wearing mutton-chop sideburns, flecked gray, and an afro shaped like a mushroom cap, hip as you got in those days. He greets his guest with a cigarette between his fingers and his legs purposely slew-footed, as if he were posing for Esquire. It will make better pictures for the photographer he is hired to trail him and the guests all night. Soon the set piece begins to take shape. There's Joe Llewellyn, who hit town back in the 30s and played in The Great White Hope, and three men standing together in velvet suits that forewarn the fashion crimes of the 70s. On a foot-high stand above the crowd, Sweets Edison is on trumpet under the green striped tent over the patio. Hampton Hawes is playing piano with his head reared back. Everybody has a glass of something in one hand and a cigarette in the other, like jewelry. There's his mother-in-law near the hot pink tulip-upholstered love seat in a $400 gown and a solid gold bracelet he bought her and which he complained she never gave him credit for. And she's greeting and upstaging as if she paid for the whole shebang. I ignored it, I ignored it, he would say years later, betraying that he most certainly had not. There are two or three wet bars, help everywhere, dressed in maids' uniforms and monkey suits, people checking coats, people parking cars, people pouring martinis, people picking up dishes before they have a chance to clink the top of an end table. There's Bunny sticking her tongue out at the camera, and Ray Charles under the tent over the patio by the band, and Robert's bookie, and a judge, a postmaster, and a dentist, Robert's sister gold in pink chiffon on a bar stool holding a pack of Marlboros, Keisha Brown, a gospel rock singer, sweating on stage in blood-red velvet, Madison in a three-piece suit that thankfully met Robert's approval, doing the funky chicken with a woman in white bell-bottoms, Alice in her cat-eye glasses posing for pictures, calm and dignified in that heavy beaded dress by the staircase. The following Thursday, December 31st, 1970, a breathless review ran on page C2 of the Los Angeles Sentinel, declaring it certainly the party of the year without a doubt, phrasing that unwittingly introduced the very doubt it sought to dispel. The column ran without pictures and began like this. One of the Angel City's most fabulous parties to date was given by the Robert Fosters on Christmas Day at their home on Victoria Avenue. The prominent physician and his wife, who is president of the L.A. chapter of the Lynx, had their large backyard area tinted for the occasion, and the View Park decorators had a field day. For her party, Alice wore a Malcolm Star original that fairly sparkled with jewels. Mrs. Rufus E. Clement, formerly of Atlanta and Louisville, Kentucky, now makes her home in L.A. with her daughter and son-in-law and assisted in receiving the 400 guests. Who was there? Well, we could easily say the who's who of L.A. society. And believe it or not, 
At times there were as many as two hundred beautiful people, milling, sipping, and just having a marvelous time on Christmas Day at the Robert Foster's. This was certainly the party of the year, without a doubt. Robert had a photo album made of the night's festivities. It was made of brown leather, and etched onto the front was Robert's birthday in gold italics. Over the succeeding decades, he would pull out the party album before he would his wedding pictures or his medical degree. The brown leather got worn in spots from the viewing. Usually, he would not bother to mention the Sentinel story, nor the party itself, so much as what went into it. For some reason, it drops. He told me years later when I asked him about the particulars. It's not any less valuable or delicious, but for some reason it didn't seem as important as when I was putting it together. Some of the guests he never saw again. Some died. Some lost touch. It was a wrap, and everyone was marvelous. He took comfort in any sign of the night's immortality. One day he passed the stationary department at Bullock's. The invitations to his party were mounted and on display. I went in once and told the lady, That's mine, he said. She looked at me like I was a fool. I just smiled. Talking about it kept the party going, and so it never really ended in his mind. He did not wait for reviews. He solicited them. He called Jimmy Marshall, one of his oldest friends from back in Monroe, right after the party. Jimmy, did I wig him? he asked. Yeah, you hit it, Jimmy said. What are they saying? What are they thinking? Robert asked Jimmy. Everyone was bowled over, of course. Jimmy didn't want to say it, but the Monroe people thought he had gone too far. The black maid in the black and white dress and white bow in the foyer was over the top even for Robert. We've been maids long enough, Jimmy told Robert. People didn't go for that. Robert didn't take it too well. Either he answered or cussed, Jimmy said decades later, which I didn't care in either case. As long as the two had known each other, Robert's fixations never made sense to Jimmy. He always sought approval, Jimmy said, and I never understood it because he had it all. Part 5 Aftermath The migrants were gradually absorbed into the economic, social, and political life of the city. They have influenced and modified it. The city has, in turn, changed them. St. Clair Drake and Horace H. Caton, Black Metropolis. In the places they left. The only thing we are proud of in connection with the South is that we left it. Jefferson L. Edmonds, the publisher of The Liberator, one of the first colored newspapers in Los Angeles. Chickasaw County, Mississippi, 1970. Ida May Brandon Gladney. The raw wood cabins and gravel roads that broke the clearings in the bottomlands of Chickasaw County did not change much in the thirty years after Ida May and millions of other black people left the South in a migration that was now slowing down as Mississippi began fitfully opening up. Mr. Ed, whose land Ida May and her husband had sharecropped, died of a heart attack back in 1945, a few years after Ida May went north. Willie Jim, who came with Mr. Ed looking for Joe Lee that night all those years ago over the missing turkeys, was still alive. He ran a thousand-acre plantation with up to two hundred hoe hands and forty sharecropper families well into the 1960s. The land was still devoted to cotton, but big combines and mechanical harvesters now did most of the work. The people who had not gone north now worked in factories, textile mills, and hardware plants, factories that made polyfoam and felt for the manufacture of furniture, and factories that made trailers, sewer pipes, corrugated boxes, shipping crates. The county and the rest of Mississippi and the old Confederacy had come out on the other side of a second civil war, the war over civil rights for the servant caste of the South. Chickasaw County had not been in the middle of it, had not been a focus of Martin Luther King or the Freedom Riders. It was too sparsely populated and too out of the way. But it was no less resistant to change, especially when it came to black people voting, where intemperate individuals of both races created incidents best forgotten, 
the Chickasaw County Historical and Genealogical Society wrote dismissively of the era, and when it came to the integration of the schools, which had been segregated for longer than most anyone had been alive. It was in 1954 that the Supreme Court ruled on Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, declaring segregated schools inherently unequal and therefore unconstitutional. In a subsequent ruling in 1955, the court ordered school boards to eliminate segregation with all deliberate speed. Much of the South translated that phrase loosely to mean whenever they got around to it, which meant a time frame closer to a decade than a semester. This is the end of disc number 15. Please insert disc number 16. Context of white supremacy. The number to dial is 760-569-7676 and the code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you have questions, would like to participate. The number again, 760 Five six nine seven six seven six, and the code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, for folks who do not want to use their phone to dial in, you can use the flash phone. Uh, should be a button, big black button, middle of the page. If you're listening in at the Black Talk Radio uh, page, uh, it says call the show. You can press that. Uh, if you're not listening at Black Talk Radio, uh, the Earl is tiny, T I N Y dot C C forward slash one race, the number one. Uh, again, it's tiny dot C C forward slash one race. Uh, once you put that URL in, it will open a small window. All you need to do, first line, uh, it's a drop-down menu. Select the number, which is 760-569-7676. And the code is 564-943-POUND. Excuse me, just the number. Don't Don't put the code in. Don't put the code in. My bad. So just select the number. You'll see it. It's a drop down menu. You can't type anything anyway. So all you're doing is picking the number on the second line. That's where you put the code, which is 564943. Then on the third line, you can either you can leave it blank. You can put in a fake name or whatever. Uh, once you're done, just click the green button at the bottom of that tiny window and it should connect you to the program. You should be able to hear us uh, on the air uh, and then. If you're interested in talking, if you use the uh, flash phone, same procedure as if you dialed in on the phone, uh, just press star six and you should hear an audio prompt to press the number one and it'll put your hand up. I'll connect you uh, on the program uh, at any rate. Uh, almost done. I think we should have two more sessions uh, after this I might actually go into November, which is... Uh, not really sure what to say about that other than we started this book in July and it looks like it might go all the way into November before we conclude things. Um, the showing off continues. I feel like uh, we started off, I was saying, you know, we should be looking for parallels, uh, things that even though this book is talking about a period of time from roughly the 1915 or 1910s all the way through the 1970s that she easily could be talking about black people uh, and things that we're doing right now, 2013, all the way into 2014. Uh, it's just the fashion is a little different. The cars they're driving are a little different, but practice of racism, white supremacy is still the same. And unfortunately, many of our uh, responses to racism, white supremacy uh, are unfortunately the same. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I keep hearing that. So I feel like I'll have to do it. We should have, like I said, two more programs on this 
particular book before it's done. Uh, I feel like uh, I need to get in uh, the song from Goody Mob. I think it's uh, The Nigger Experience, uh, where CeeLo Green, where he gets to the end, and he says, uh, buying all these clothes, spending all this money on rims and cars and all this flashy stuff, and all for another nigger to see. I feel like uh, that's I feel like I've said it. I've referenced it. I've thought it so many times listening to the book and just hearing Dr. Pershing poster about this massive party uh, that he throws uh, for his birthday on December 25th. Just wow. All. uh, And then, I mean, he is saying it after the party's over. He's he's going around looking for for feedback. What do people think? Did I did I blow them away? Did I blow their minds with with the party? All for another nigga to see. Um yeah, I'll, I'll hush there. Uh, Mr. Demery for launch to be open. Uh, do you have any thoughts you want to share? Oh, looks like he got disconnected. Not sure if people are having uh, difficulties with the uh, phone line. Uh, if you, I know that was an issue yesterday where some people were calling in and got uh, disconnected, dropped. Um, if you're having phone issues, you can shoot me an email or a message and let me know that as well. Um, it also, I think one of the first incidents that they shared this week, uh, they were in Chicago with Ida Mae Gladney and her husband, George. And they were talking about when she had a car accident. Uh, it says it wasn't too rough or anything. She just had a few bruises, I think what they said. And it says her husband, George, uh, fussed at her. Like, how could you get hit by a car? I can't believe that. Uh, and, and she said uh, that that was, that was the only way that he knew how to show that he cared. And I thought, wow, that's another part of our victimization. I think that's the case, unfortunately, for many black people. Um, we, I think we, I even remember hearing that in Warriors Don't Cry, where Melba Patilla Beal, she was with uh, one of the other victims, members of the Little Rock Nine, and she was with, uh, I was a female student, she was with her, and she, uh, it was Minnie Jean Brown, trick me, that's who she was with. She was with Minnie Jean, and she couldn't open up and tell her how much she missed her. I think this is when she had been kicked out of school, and she wanted to tell her how much, uh, how much she meant to her, how much she cared about her, but she just, she just couldn't do it. And I feel like that's the case uh, for many, many victims of racism, white supremacy, where it's just very hard for us to open up about how much we care about other victims, other black people. Uh, it's just, it's difficult for a variety of reasons. And so frequently when what you want to do is express your compassion uh, concern, affection for that black person. It ends up just coming out, comes out mad. I think that's the song um, uh, from my guest that we had on the program earlier. I'll give it. Uh, the author, uh, slipping my mind, she's actually author and she's been a guest on the program. Camille Yarbrough came to me Camille Yarbrough it comes out mad I think she captures it uh, beautifully it comes out mad Uh, at any rate I see uh, Mr. Demery for dial back in we also have a caller at a blocked number Uh, if you all have any thoughts that you would like to share uh, your line should be open I also want to encourage other folks to share this is supposed to be a book club it's not really supposed to be just people spectating Uh, that has been a pattern, another pattern with uh, victims of racism. Uh, and that's why I do my comparison contrast pretty regularly. Um, we're talking about sex. Seems like people are very chatty. Uh, then they have lots to say, lots that they want to add to the discussion. We're talking about other things. People don't tend to have uh, the same enthusiasm for talking. Uh, if it's supposed to be a book club, uh, you're supposed to be sharing. It's supposed to be people. Uh, in this case, we don't even have to do the reading before the program. We're just listening. And then talking about what we heard and what uh, what happened in the book. So I would encourage folks to share. That's what the book club is supposed to be all about. Not listening, but actively participating. Uh, the folks that dialed in uh, think B. Moore should be with us. See if it'll work this time. No, we've had some, some issues with uh, the phone. 
and it looks like those issues continue. I'm not sure what the uh, what the deal is on VMore's end, but it's not uh, not allowing me to unmute your line. But we should have the caller with the block number, and we should have uh, Mr. Demery for your line. Both of your lines should be open. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, greetings, Gus, to the other callers. <clears throat> I think uh, some accolades may be in order. It's been an excellent week. I've enjoyed uh, listening uh, during the week. I think that uh, you outdid yourself this week. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation uh, for your show and for you doing this book. I've learned a lot, and I continue to listen and, and support your efforts. And... Uh, I wish you continued uh, success. Well, um, starting out here, I noticed that uh, they started out in the 1960s where they said that uh, the 60s bear fruit that black children were entering white schools, and which brought to mind that that was the beginning of integration, and we're not sure at this point whether or not that was a good thing or not. We have some uh, mixed reviews on that. That seemed to <clears throat> has brought about its own set of problems. You know, once we uh, got into uh, a close proximity of white people. Uh, and then they talked about... Um, uh, George and Ida May, and uh, of course you mentioned earlier, she was hit, you know, by a car trying to cross 82nd Street in Chicago, and um, I made note of the fact that if that had been nowadays, that would have been a lawsuit, you know, even if you didn't have enough money to pay the lawyers. If you had, could get a hold of an attorney and let them know that you were hit by a car, you may have some compensation coming your way. And uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that, uh, that her husband did not uh, he could not express his concern appropriately. You know, he, matter of fact, he was fussing at her. You know, his inability to express his uh, emotions appropriately, which was, you know, a result of the uh, terrorism and the way the system has affected us. I also noted that... Um, the part <clears throat> where, where she couldn't talk about her daughter that, I guess, died in a car crash earlier. I thought about your favorite saying, when we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. So the fact that she didn't want to talk about it or that she avoided talking about it reminds me of now, uh, nowadays, when we bring up racism uh, in today's uh, society, and the black people either don't want to hear it or they don't want to talk about it. One guy told me he just rather live his life and have fun than to even think about uh, racism or the terrorism that we are experiencing nowadays. Um, I make note of the fact that um, the examples of the immigrants coming to the United States and their ability to assimilate into uh, the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, wasp 
uh, white Anglo-Saxon uh, society here in America, you know, uh, and the contrast to blacks not being able to do that is one of the examples of a result of a system of white supremacy which provides for white privilege here in America. And with the exception of extraordinarily light-skinned blacks passing as whites, uh, heavy melanated or melanated individuals uh, do not have uh, an opportunity to assimilate in this society and we're, uh, we're uh, treated uh, harshly and it's kind of like Dr. Wilson was saying, uh, if you're black, get back. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. And white is all right. But I also made um, reference to, they said that the migrants, contrary to the common assumptions about childbearing, and welfare among blacks, that the black migrants compensated for the disadvantages that they face by cutting back in every way, even having fewer children. You know, which brings up lying and deception is a big part of the maintenance of the system of white supremacy. So although there may be a portion of black people receiving uh, aid for dependent children. There are numerous white people that receive the same benefits, and the amount of blacks pale in comparison to whites. They even uh, gave some numbers, and I, I always say that these scholars and these studies that record these numbers do it for a particular reason so that they can keep tabs on how the population of black people uh, is coming along. They want to make sure that there were more whites being born during a period of time than blacks, almost double. And if you had all the different types of immigrants from Europe on top of the whites that were already here, the, the was the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, then you have a tremendous amount of disparity in the population growth. And I think they keep track of that just to reassure themselves that... Uh, they can continue to be on top and to continue to uh, terrorize people that are not white. Uh, she made a comment that blacks con confronted hostilities more severely than most all other groups, except perhaps Mexicans. But we all know that even in a system of white supremacy, the lighter skinned individuals, even the Mexicans, you know, are treated with somewhat of a better lot than the heavy melanated black people. Uh, I know that Ida May kept to herself. She was sort of in her own world. Her, her life was around her family church, similar to the way that it would have been back in Mississippi, and it, it served her well, I guess, in the north, you know, and uh, that could be up for debate, whether or not she, you know, could have uh, uh, tried to meet others, and, but, you know. I guess in her particular situation, it, it worked to her 
advantage. So, uh, I'll uh, mute my line now and give someone else a chance. I can uh, continue a little later. Uh, thanks for taking the call. I'll mute my line. Thank you for the commentary, Mr. Uh, Demry Four. Good points. Very good points. Uh, the person that dialed in from a block number, you should be with us as well. Good evening, Gus. Um, good evening, everyone. May I be heard okay, or is this a bad line? You are crystal clear. Good. Um, this is um, Karma Pippins I called earlier. I really enjoyed reading this book. It has it has answered so many questions for me because my grandparents and my parents were part of the Great Migration, and then they started coming back and forth, so it's now just a trail. But um, I had always thought that because of what my mother and father would say, that they were the, that everything that bad happened was because of them, and it was because their family was dysfunctional, and, it, and, it, and all of the bad things are just an isolated incident, which is the way they took it and they described it, so they were really ashamed of everything all the time, and they would never communicate anything to us. It was like the thing that cannot be spoken, the thing that cannot be said, and I have been taking this book and reading parts of it and saying, is this not exactly what you were saying that happened to your family? This happened to millions of people. But I think that um, the black people have been, so, have been made ashamed of their own history so much that they never spoke of it and they really didn't realize that they were part of a very great thing that was happening to everyone. I mean, I, I just assumed my mother was... My mother's family were the only sharecroppers. You know, it's just, just like, we, it was us. And, you know, they were the only people who couldn't find housing in Chicago. It was us, you know. And my cousins were hillbillies. And, and they caused all of the white people to leave the neighborhood. And, and I, this has cleared up so much for me. It really has. You know, and I said, um, in the part that... Um, when George was talking about he preaches to all the young people to get an education, get an education, I said, this is exactly what the older generation is doing now. They're preaching about getting an education instead of giving us the context, the history of how they got there and how they why they value this education so much. And I said, that's why they're failing to make an impression on the younger generation. There is a blank spot. They should be giving us the context. They should be like, you. what did he say? You need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. They need to be telling the history. Even if it's this late, they need to be telling us the history. Because, because I was reading a passage to my mother, and she said, you know, the worst part wasn't the lynchings when we were little. The worst part is that they refused to let us take the bodies down. So we would just have to keep walking by them all the time. And I just... I just, this book is just, it's just brought so many pieces of my life together instead of me having all of these little disconnected pieces. You know, and I just, I think that what's really missing is context. We, we need to start giving children the history. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, how did your... How did your family members respond when you read them passages and said, you know, is this, is this similar to what happened to you, and how did they take all that? Well, like I said, they would, they would finally start having remembrances, and instead of just making a comment that was full of pain and it was disconnected, they would give me... They would give me a little more history, like my mother would say, you know, how awful white people were. She would, she would, she gave me the whole story. She said, well, you know, we were in Money, Mississippi, you know, where, where Emmett Till came down. But um, we, we left before he got there because we knew those people were crazy. She said, we had to, um, we had to get someone. She said, I remember, my mother told us, don't take anything, just take a lunch. And we all lay down in the back of a wagon with nothing. 
except for paper bags so no one would know where we were leaving. She said, your grandfather had already gone to Chicago to get us a place to live. So we just acted, you know, like we were just going to town, sneaking into town. But they even put blankets on the wagon wheels so that people wouldn't hear us, you know. And and then, and then I said, oh, amazing. And she's like, yeah. And so whenever I give her an excerpt that sounds like, something I might have heard her say, just something disconnected, she flushes it out for me. So I'm I'm finally getting her to speak about those things that cannot be spoken, you know. It's just, it's great. It's great. I finally get my history. I think Isabel Wilkerson, I've heard her say over and over and over again in interviews, again, all three of the main characters, uh, Ida Mae Gladney, Dr. Pershing Foster, and uh, George Starling, all three of them died before this book was published, but she said that pretty much all of them had said to a person that they had not talked about a lot of these experiences. Um, I think most of them had said that repeatedly. They hadn't talked about this with their children, other people that for a lot of these, these incidents that she put in the book, um, this was the first time that they had talked about this stuff. Um, and I think even in some of the interviews that I've heard, she was even saying that her parents, uh, talking about Isabel, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, her parents were part of the migration too. They also didn't talk about what happened. And I feel like that is a constant thread, even 2013, when I was saying before how, you know, people aren't participating when it gets to workplace racism and people are silent as if white people haven't terrorized them all week long for 40 hours on the job and they don't have anything to say. I think that is just one of the patterns. Uh, we feel exactly what you said about your parents, whether it's shame, whether it's we blame ourselves and feel like somehow it was our weakness uh, our incompetence, you know, that brought about this misfortune as opposed to putting the blame where it should be on whites, uh, where we just end up not talking, just repressing these incidents. We don't share with other people. We don't share with our children. I feel like that is, it's just one of the biggest problems, deficits with regards to why we haven't solved this problem. Because just like you said, I think we would see, oh man, they're doing this to millions of black people. This is not just me. This is not a, de- a, de- a deficit with me. There's not as if I have some sort of dysfunction. It's just they are about terrorizing and they're so systematic that the exact same thing that they did to me, they've done to, as I said, probably millions of other black people uh, in the exact same way. So I'm thrilled um, that you you were able to have that experience with your with your family members uh, and to kind of get them to open to open up and, and talk a little bit more about some of these things. Um, I'm going to see if I could get uh, B more on as well, um, see if she had any input she wanted to add to the discussion. I think she was having phone difficulties. Uh, forgive the ring. We'll see if it works out. have reached the All right. not available right now we try to be more hope she's listening in um i guess uh i guess i'll ask also uh really quick or i won't ask i guess it'll just be a statement i'll get in really quick and then if you'll have other things that you want to share about the section um with regard to those statistics that were shared about the fertility rates how they were so low for black migrants uh, when they went north um Number one, that deception, I think uh, Mr. Demery Ford talked about that deception. White people have been saying for decades, black welfare moms that come up here and have all these children and just leech off of the system. They just want to get on the dole and have more and more children. And they know, uh, I always take the position that white people are not ignorant. They've got these statistics. They're the ones who commission and pay money to get these, to get this information, to get this data. They know. Oh. They're making sure they're not having as many children. That's exactly what we want, to make sure that those birth rates are down. We do not want a whole bunch of dark children uh, running around here. 
consciously, deliberately lying in the practice of racism and white supremacy. It is an all-day, 24-7 job for them. Uh, the other thing, just the statistic, I think Mr. Demery Ford touched on that before as well, white people are not ignorant. Uh, I think Isabel Wilkerson, that's one of the things that I love about this book, is that it's so thoroughly well-researched. She has a bevy of information where white people have been writing books about this all throughout the years. A lot of this material is 50, 60, 70 years old where white people had been writing about, detailing, studying, making their observations about black people's comings and goings, what they were doing. They're not ignorant. They make it their business to be very informed about their business, the primary business on the planet, which is dominating non-white people. Um, also, the statistics that she gave I guess it wasn't st uh, statistics per se, but when she was talking about the kind of comparison contrast between the black people and the wave of immigrants from Europe, for me, and it's not a, a slight at Miss Wilkerson, again, it's white people published this book, white people edited this book, they certainly could have had a major hand, and I suspect that they did, and how the book sounds, the final product that we have with us now, but all of the efforts to make some sort of comparison or parallel between black people and other people who have migrated to a certain area, it just, what, matter of fact, I'll read it, but I mean, for me, what she shared made it so over-the-top offensive because there is no comparison. And she, she says as much in the book, I'm glad that information was there, these folks were able to assimilate and become white. If you're making a comparison between black people who she says the most mistreated, which I say is still in effect 2013, if you're saying that, then it's no way you can make a comparison to a group of people when they move, they get to become white. They don't have to worry. They don't have to say, well, oh, my children, what are they going to do because they're not white and they don't want us there. They're not giving us extortion level rent and so on and so forth. Well, this just goes on for forever. Uh, it, in my view, it's it's just it's totally disingenuous and it is inaccurate uh, to make those sort of comparisons. I feel like we do a lot of that frequently as victims to try to appease white people, to try to relate to them and try to make them see uh, some humanity in us. And I feel like that just that misses it entirely. We're dealing with psychopaths. They do not empathize with black people ever. Uh, but let's see. She says, uh, I mean, it's just it's so succinct. She says there's just no avoiding the fact that blacks were more severely discriminated against in the labor market and elsewhere. Lieberson wrote, they had to work more hours to earn less money than anyone else. The historian Gilbert Osofsky. And I love the fact that she's quoting, as I said, white people are not ignorant about this. When white people sit around, huh, what are you talking about, black people? We've got females that are mistreated and gay people and all that. They know. It's like they just stand in your face and lie about this when they know they've got this material stacked up in their libraries about what they have done, what they plan to do. I mean, yeah, I was glad she said, I think there was one more passage about the, the immigrant portion I wanted to get in really quick. And then if you all have other things you want to share, you can, you can get that in as well. This is it. She says, uh, the presence of so many black migrants elevated the status of other immigrants in the North and West. Black Southerners stepped into a hierarchy that assigned them a station beneath everyone else, no matter their fam no matter that their family their families had been in the country for centuries. Their arrival unwittingly diverted anti-immigrant antagonism their way as they were an even less favored outsider group than the migrants they encountered in the North and helped to make formerly ridiculed groups more acceptable by comparison. And this is standard. There are so many texts that talk about this, whether it's the Irish or the Italian or whatever other group of people get here and get their white card by stomping on black people. Uh, this has happened time immemorial. White people are very well aware of it. And just uh, to reiterate, I'm just, I think this right here for me invalidates that whole comparison and saying that black people were just like any other group of people who migrated to some other part of the world. And I'll mute my line if y'all have other things you want to touch on. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, yeah, I wanted to say something about uh, when you uh, started the program off, 
you spoke about Mr. William uh, Nickerson Jr. That was very important uh, that you mentioned people like him because people like that seem to be omitted from history and they had a very important role, especially um, when it comes to uh, African Americans in this country. I remember I wanted to say a little something. Uh, my mother was a insurance agent for Atlanta Life Insurance Company out of Atlanta, Georgia, and they were a black uh, life insurance company <clears throat> in the particular area where I grew up. Um, we were used to uh, white men coming around. If you saw a white man come in the neighborhood with a suit on, he was either uh, collecting some money or trying to sell something. So most of the uh, uh, insurance agents were white men, and they would come and get these premiums from elderly blacks that were just making you know, minimum payments on term life that would get them buried, you know, in case, you know, well, when they passed on. And there were so many cases where um, they did not receive those benefits upon the loved one passing on. Another form of discrimination, uh, uh, racism, that was perpetrated upon the poor black in, in the particular area where I grew up. And so it was very important when Atlanta Life entered into our particular area. And the uh, blacks were able to purchase term life insurance. And I witnessed my mother, uh, you know, personally hand those checks. Uh, over to the uh, families of the deceased. So that's just, you know, one element, uh, another element of how we were mistreated, you know, in this system. And then it may go unrealized if it was not for, you know, uh, an audience like this or, you know, someone like yourself you know, bringing this out, and I, I just wanted to, you know, share that. Uh, also, uh, uh, George Sterling, um, he realized that uh, he had brought a lot of his problems upon himself. He had uh, <clears throat> a number of them, but he had a lot of regrets, you know, later on in life. He's in his 50s now. He's got these regrets, but he he had gotten another woman pregnant. He had married a female that he did not love. He had, he had married because of spite for his father. And I made a note that you know, all this had to do with selfishness because when when George was discussing his his life, it's all about him. What about the people that he affected? The woman that he got pregnant, you know, uh, the wife that he married that he did not love, all of the people, his kids that were sucked into the uh, system when they uh, got up north, you know, because he was away a lot. There had to be ways that he could have uh, done a little better parody. You know, he, he never accepted any of those. Uh, well, maybe the book did point out that he accepted some of the blame, but I think that a lot of it had to do with selfishness that he probably a big part of it did not realize, you know, in his life. Uh, then we went on to, uh, oh, the part about 
he said that uh, he was born, happened to be, it was an accident of birth, that he was uh, born during a time where he suffered terrors, terrorism and injustice of Jim Crow. Well, you know, he was just in time for James Crow. So he was in time to see enough of the refined racism to understand, or maybe he didn't, that not much has changed in it anyway. And then the book pointed out that uh, he turned to religion uh, for solace. And I think later on in the book, they got him singing in the choir or whatever. But, you know, nevertheless, uh, on to Robert. And like you say, I took note of the fact that when he threw the big party, he had unpronounceable top shelf spirits. Now, that's something else right there. You couldn't even pronounce the liquor that Dr. Foster had. And, but even with Dr. Foster, in his mind, he still remembered a birthday party when he was a little boy and no, the four people showed up. He never forgot about the motel incident where they wouldn't give him a room. The colonel from Mississippi that wouldn't let him operate on the white woman. Uh, the differences that he had with his father-in-law. And I think he's probably the first person I've heard of that had a superiority complex as well as an inferiority complex. But uh, I think I can... Uh, <laughs> one other thing, uh, Dr. Smithfield Helms in Virginia is supposed to be, uh, I guess, some, some of the best Helms in the United States. And they mentioned that he had that in his party. But uh, just recently found out that the Chinese has bought Smith, uh, Smithfield hams. So now the Chinese are uh, part of the white tradition. So I'll mute my line. Thank you. They were talking about that on TV. There was a good chunk of white people. They were upset about uh, so-called Chinese buying the ham company uh, and saying, you know, they're taking over. It's the same thing they were saying about non-white people. But, yeah, they were, uh, it was a good chunk of white people. They were up in arms uh, about that earlier this year. Um, I think also I wanted to make sure I got in as well the portion where they were talking about um, which character this is. I think this might have been George when he was talking about going to the North. And he says, uh, he was talking about the segregationist, racist white people training their terriers to mock black people in the South. Uh, and it reminded me, because there was just a report that came out uh, in the past seven days where police officers in California have been training their dogs to attack black people. And again, white people, they had statistics where it was this high, extraordinary number of black people that had been bitten by police dogs and uh, even so-called Latinos, non-white people who had also been bitten and attacked by police dogs. And it was way, way higher than the number of white people that had been attacked by dogs. And there's even a, a segment, if you get the DVD for Training Day, Denzel Washington won his Academy Award, uh, the, one of the deleted scenes where it's talking about uh, this, some white guy has paid a black person to beat the dog and he says explicitly he's training the dog to hate niggers uh, but that's in one of the deleted scenes for training day but it just that passage right there reminded me because I think that was from earlier in the book when the white guy had trained the dog uh, I think to play dead he said would you rather be dead or a nigger and the dog plays dead <laughs> like white people just tacky trifling all day long um, female call anything else you want to get in before we get to the second segment of the audio book no I'm good Right on, right on. Take notes. If anything sticks out, if you didn't get to share uh, during the first portion of the audio, just, you know, write it down. We'll uh, have ample time to share during the second portion of the audio book. Um, I think that's in Kanye West's song, too. I think we had to get both of those in. His song, It All Falls Down, where he's talking about uh, getting all this stuff 
to uh, impress other black people or shame other black people because they don't have it uh, and saying you got all this stuff and you can't even pronounce the names. That's something else. It seems like we've been doing for a long, long time uh, as a pitiful response under racism, white supremacy. Um, yeah, we will do better, though. No showing off. That's in the code book. No showing off. We're still on the slave ship. No reason to show off until we end the system of white supremacy. And even then, still no reason to show off. Uh, we'll get started. Audio segment number two. Uh, good to hear from the folks that dialed in. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, The Warmth of Other Sons, Context of White Supremacy, segment number two. One county in Virginia, Prince Edward County, closed its entire school system for five years, from 1959 to 1964, rather than integrate. The state funneled money to private academies for white students, but black students were left on their own. They went to live with relatives elsewhere, studied in church basements, or forewent school altogether. County supervisors relented only after losing their case in the U.S. Supreme Court, choosing finally to reopen the schools rather than face imprisonment. It would take more than 15 years before most of the South conceded to the Brown ruling, and then only under additional court orders. This was passionately opposed, wrote the Chickasaw Historical Society, not only by most of the whites, but by some of the blacks as well. That sentiment, if true, would have been explained away by the blacks who left, as an indication that the blacks who stayed may have been more conciliatory than many of the people in the Great Migration. It wasn't until the 1970-71 school year that integration finally came to Chickasaw County, and then only after a 1969 court order, Alexander v. Holmes, that gave county and municipal schools in Mississippi until February 1970 to desegregate. But even that deadline would be extended for years for particularly recalcitrant counties. All the marching and court rulings did little to change some Southerners' hearts. A 1968 survey found that 83% of whites said they preferred a system with no integration, and they acted on those preferences. By 1970, 158 new white private schools had opened up in Mississippi. By 1971, a quarter of the white students were in private schools, the white families paying tuition many could scarcely afford. Mothers went back to work to help cover tuition, spent all their savings and forfeited luxuries and necessities in life, some splitting their children up and enduring the expense and inconvenience of transporting the children long distances to and from school, according to the Mississippi-born scholar Mark Lowry, to avoid having their children sit in the same classroom with black children. In the meantime, in the middle of the turmoil over what would become of the children of Mississippi, dozens of school districts forewent federal funding rather than integrate their schools. During the worst of things, at least one school superintendent, Lowry wrote, committed suicide. Eustis, Florida, 1970. George Swanson Starling. Lake County, Florida, began to join the rest of the free world in the late 1960s and early 1970s, six decades into the Great Migration, when black children and white children, for the first time in county history, began sitting in the same buildings to learn their cursive and multiplication tables. Change did not come without incident. The first sign of trouble was a fight at the newly integrated high school between a white boy and a black boy. It fell to the black assistant principal, who had been demoted from principal of the colored high school, to an assistant at the reconstituted school, to intervene. It was unclear who started what, but the black assistant principal ruled in favor of the white student to the outcries of reverse favoritism from the black parents. The black people could not understand why he should discipline this black kid that had an altercation with the white kid, and they'd been dogging us all our lives, George Starling, who had been keeping close contact, said years later. The assistant principal was his stepbrother in that small world of Eustis, Florida. The black parents felt the white student had started the fight by provoking the black student, and that the assistant principal should have ruled accordingly. But in the tinderbox of what was still very much an experiment in caste integration, he had little choice. 
We're crying out against prejudice and mistreatment, George said. If you want it eliminated, you have to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. When the next big fight broke out, Willis McCall rode up with his police dog to go after the black student. This time, the black parents rose up and protested. A churchload of them, emboldened by the civil rights gains and the counterbalancing effect of all the people they knew up north, rode over to the county seat of Tavares, got a Reverend Jones to speak for them, and protested to the Lake County School Board. The people let Willis McCall know that they weren't scared of him or his dog. Viola Dunham, a longtime resident with three boys in school at the time, remembered. We let him know he does not run the school system. We let them know we didn't want Willis McCall raising our children, and we did not back down that time. Since the 1940s, Willis McCall had cast a long shadow over Lake County. His handling of the Groveland case, in which a white woman accused four black men of raping her back in 1949, had made national headlines and put Lake County on the map as a symbol of racial injustice. McCall had shot two shackled defendants while transporting them the night before their second trial. One of the men, Walter Irvin, actually survived the shooting and lived to tell how McCall had taken the backwoods, stopped in a remote location, told them to get out, and shot them. After being hospitalized for his wounds, Irvin was retried, reconvicted, and once again sentenced to death. A few years later, a new governor, Leroy Collins, reviewed his case and in 1955 commuted Irvin's death sentence to life imprisonment. It was a stunning decision at that time in the Jim Crow South, and one handed down against the vehement opposition of Sheriff McCall and other white Floridians. The governor, a segregationist but otherwise a moderate by Southern standards, was disturbed by the many shortcomings in the case. My conscience told me it was a bad case, badly handled, badly tried, and now on this bad performance I was asked to take a man's life, Collins later said. My conscience would not let me do it. His death sentence commuted, Walter Irvin would be imprisoned for eighteen years for a crime he maintained his whole life he had not committed. DNA testing was not yet in use to prove or disprove his claim. In 1969, he was paroled on the condition that he never set foot in Lake County again, but the following year he was granted permission to visit his family there for a single day. Soon after he got there, he dropped dead while sitting on a front porch. He was forty-two years old. Officials like McCall said he had a heart attack. But after all that had preceded Irvin's death, some black people in town believed it was no accident. Into the early 1970s, Willis McCall was still the sheriff of Lake County. He was still wearing his ten-gallon hats. The Groveland case had made him something of a celebrity among Florida segregationists. He would become the center of case after case of alleged abuse and misconduct against black people in the county. He would be investigated 49 times and survive every one of them. As the world began to change around him, he stood his ground in defense of the old order of things. When President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963, the only public building in the United States that refused to lower its flag to half-staff was McCall's jail in Tavares, the Lake County seat, according to the author Ben Green. Colored-only and white-only signs were coming down all over the South during the 1960s, but Sheriff McCall did not take down the colored waiting room sign in his office until September 1971, and then only under threat of a federal court order. He may have been the last elected official in the country to remove his Jim Crow sign, Green said. McCall was re-elected seven times, that is, until 1972, when Florida Governor Reuben Askew stepped in and suspended him after yet another violent assault on someone in his custody. This time, McCall was indicted for second-degree murder for allegedly kicking a black prisoner to death. The prisoner was in jail for a $26 traffic ticket. McCall was acquitted. But he lost the election that November. Blacks were now able to vote, and they turned out in force to defeat him the first chance they got. 
we sent cars out and taxicabs. Viola Dunham, a longtime resident and the sister-in-law of George Starling, remembered. We started getting these people out to vote. Then, too, a new generation of whites had entered the Florida electorate, the younger people who may have identified with the young freedom riders in Mississippi and Alabama, even if they would not have participated themselves. And the snowbirds, the white northerners who were buying up vacation homes or retiring to central Florida with the boom that came with the arrival of Disney World and who couldn't relate to the heavy-handedness of a small-town southern sheriff. And now it seemed that even the most steadfast traditionalists had finally tired of the controversies and felt it was time for him to go. The defeated sheriff retreated to his ranch on Willis v. McCall Road in Eustace, where he tended his citrus grove, welcomed his partisans, and held forth on his decades of lordship over Lake County. He could take comfort in the fact that, for better or for worse, Lake County would not soon forget him, and he took pride in his role of protecting Southern tradition. The times might have changed, but he never would or sought to. Displayed in his home was the colored waiting room sign that once hung in his office and that he was forced to take down under threat of a court order. Nobody in the world was going to tell him what he could do or what he could hang in his own home on Willis v. McCall Road. Monroe, Louisiana, Early 1970s. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. The Fosters had always had a complicated relationship with their hometown of Monroe, or rather with the few other ambitious and educated black people maneuvering among themselves for the few spoils allowed them in a segregated world. The rivalries would pass from one generation to the next until it no longer mattered because most of the Foster descendants had died, or like Robert, migrated away. As prominent as the Fosters had been, there would be no direct descendants living there by the 1970s, and the rivalries would play out from afar. In the time since Robert drove away from Monroe for good, Robert's father had died, his brother Madison had visited Los Angeles for surgery and died from complications there, his brother Leland had moved to the Midwest, his sister Gold had followed Robert to L.A. in the 1960s, and his nephew, Madison James, was in graduate school at the University of Michigan and not likely to move back. But even before Robert migrated west, the Fosters had begun to languish like deposed monarchs on the outskirts of influence in town. By the 1950s, Professor Foster had been edged out of his principalship and a new colored high school had gone up to replace the old one the Fosters had run for decades. There was a time when hardly any black child in Monroe could get through high school without getting past a foster. Now a whole new generation was growing up not knowing who they were. Not only had many of the fosters left, but the migration had drained away many of the people who remembered them. It was the price they paid for migrating. Some old-timers expected that the new high school would be named after Professor Foster for all his years of service. He had taught, overseen, or influenced the education of most every black person in Monroe from the 1920s to the 1940s. But there were not enough partisans to push the case. The new high school would take the name of a family that had stayed in Monroe, had not run north or west or forsaken Monroe for the so-called promised land. The Carrolls had been in Wachita Parish since Reconstruction, and like others who stayed, moved into greater prominence as possible competitors migrated away. When the new school went up, it was named after one of the Carrolls, Henry Carroll, who had become the first black member of the Monroe Board of Education, rather than the retired and nearly forgotten Professor Foster. Robert's father had to watch from the sidelines as the new school he had always dreamed of rose up in the name of a rival. Papa was hurting, dying inside, Robert said, but he never let you know it. The next year, the Foster name was affixed to something the Fosters would not in principle have been against, but would not have otherwise chosen for themselves, given their preoccupation with high-minded achievement. The Fosters lost out with the high school, but as a consolation prize, a public housing project was named after Professor Foster, the Foster Heights Homes on Swayze Street, 
a few blocks from the new high school. It was as if all that Professor Foster had endured and devoted his life to had been boiled down to an assemblage of low-rise apartments of pink brick and struggling lawn. Every shooting or drug bust or robbery that might happen there and make it to the evening news, last night in a drug raid at the Foster Heights homes, would resurrect the Foster name in a way that was counter to everything the family stood for. Robert didn't want to go back to see the housing project with his surname on it, but he did and found it neatly spread out, rather like a roadside motel. He would have to go back to bury his father and big brother and sister-in-law, Harriet. Each visit was a time of melancholy. Finally, no immediate family was left. There were still no sidewalks in Newtown, and the streets were still unpaved, just as they were when he was a boy. It only confirmed that he could not have lived out his life in this place. By the early 1970s, integration was beginning to filter into everyday life in Monroe. So after visiting the graves of his mother and father and his big brother Madison, Robert decided to walk into a diner that used to be only for white people. It was a place he could only have dreamed of entering as a young man. He sat down without incident, ordered, and ate, and nobody commented on it one way or the other. It was nothing special, and in fact underwhelming after all those years of being denied entrance and dreaming of being inside. How could it be that people were fighting to the death over something that was, in the end, so very ordinary? He had crossed into territory forbidden him growing up, and now the circle was complete. It was much like returning to a building that seemed so imposing when you were a child, but was in fact small and forgettable when seen through the eyes of an adult. Before leaving Monroe, he passed the big new colored high school on Renwick Street and could not help but think of his father walking to his old schoolhouse in the dark of morning to open up Monroe Colored High with its used books from the white school and second-hand desks. The new Carroll High School was something Professor Foster could have only dreamt of in those early days, and for as long as he lived, Robert would remain convinced that it should rightly have carried his name. Robert returned to L.A. and again tried to put Monroe behind him. He would never fully be able to, and so he worked harder at everything he did. He gave all of himself to whatever was his fancy at the moment. Each December 23rd, he put aside his patience and gambling to devote himself to commemorating his marriage to Alice. He made the reservations and all the arrangements. Every year, the plan was exactly the same. Robert and Alice would go to Scandia on Sunset Boulevard. The maitre d' would make a show of the appetizer and subsequent courses. There would be a gift immediately following the entree, a diamond ring or a fur coat. There would be some grand gesture at the end and a toast to however many years it had been. But things did not always go according to plan, not in any huge, irreversible way, but in the little ways that could easily rattle Robert, who was easily rattled anyway. One anniversary, the maitre d' happened to seat them at a table in a darkened corner in the back. I couldn't stand it, Robert said. He fumed and sulked. He could barely enjoy the anniversary he was supposed to be celebrating, when he could stand it no longer, he summoned the maitre d'. Please move me to another table, Robert said. It's too dark. I tipped him, and that will work wonders. You have to be careful not to overdo it. Then you show your ignorance. Another year, the maitre d' sat them at a booth. It was in the right place in the room, but something was wrong. The booth sank in where Robert was sitting. When I sat down in the booth, my wife was taller than I, he said. I didn't like that. He told Alice to switch places with him so that I wouldn't be shorter than she was. Alice, having already settled on her side of the booth, had to collect her purse. The two got up and circled each other to take the other's seat. Only then could the evening commence. Leo, what are we going to eat tonight? There came the courses, and he would watch with pride and amazement as Alice negotiated whatever elaborate or towering concoction was put before her. Then came the part Robert liked the most, the part he put the most ritual and planning into. The morning of the dinner, he had called the florist. 
I want red roses and baby's breath, he had told the florist. I want to be able to see over the table. The florist fretted over what that meant for the arrangement, precisely what the dimensions should be. All right, get me the width and the length of the table, Robert said. Someone called the restaurant and got the measurements for the particular table Robert had reserved for this particular anniversary, and the roses and ferns could then be cut and arranged. Each year I added one red rose to that bouquet, he said. It was their thirty-third anniversary. We're in the center of the dining room, Robert remembered. The maitre d' came out with thirty-three long-stemmed roses with white baby's breath and fern and ribbon, he remembered. Each anniversary, one more ribbon. Losses It occurred to me that no matter where I lived, geography could not save me. Jacqueline Joan Johnson, who migrated from Charleston, South Carolina, to New York in 1971. Los Angeles, December 1974. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. Within four years of Robert's big party of a lifetime, Alice, who had married him to the unspoken disappointment of her upper-crust parents, had followed him to Austria and Los Angeles and Vegas, allowed herself to be his mannequin and muse, given legitimacy to his aspirations, and become his ticket to high society, which he both coveted and resented. Alice, with her cat-eye glasses and teacher's solemnity, had fallen gravely ill and died. Again, like his brother Madison, here was another family member passing away, and his medical certifications and surgical expertise could do nothing to stop it. She died of cancer, as had Robert's mother, on December 8, 1974, at the age of 54. Her passing and burial rites were both headlined in the Chicago Defender and the Atlanta Daily World, the black newspaper that had charted her every coming and going for most of her life. The Defender, taking interest from half a continent away, described her as one of Los Angeles's most prominent civic and social figures, wife of noted surgeon Dr. Robert Pershing Foster, and a tireless worker in numerous civic and philanthropic organizations. She was interred far from the tinseled veneer of Los Angeles, in Louisville, Kentucky, at her father's burial site, reclaimed in death as a Clement, not a Foster. They had been married thirty-three years, not one of them in Monroe. On that, they had both agreed. As quiet and self-contained as she was, the house felt empty and unbearably silent after she was gone. The girls were all off on their own, two now married and living back east, the youngest away at college. Robert, along with Alice's mother, Pearl, returned disheartened from the interment and took up their positions in their respective corners of the echoing mansion. As big as it was, it was feeling too small for two people so different from each other, who had put up an appearance of cordiality only to appease the one thing they had in common, sweet and devoted Alice. Neither had liked how the other seemed to control her, and now the reason they endured each other was gone and not coming back. Each missed her more than they could have possibly anticipated. Even Robert, who had directed her choice of clothing, dissected her every attribute and deficit, stayed out late tending his patience and his vices, and taken for granted that she would be there whenever he needed her, felt her absence, perhaps more than her presence, now that he no longer had it. With each passing day, Pearl grew angrier and more resentful. Of all the people in her life and all the people she had known and loved, here she was left with the one she least wanted to be around. How was it that the two of them had survived? It would never have occurred to her when she moved to Los Angeles, a widow from Atlanta, into the new wing Robert had built for her, that her daughter would precede both of them in death, and that so full a house would come down to just these two. Now Robert was asking her to contribute a little in rent each month, which she took as an insult, given how the Clements had helped them in the early years of their marriage, and how she had just now lost her only child. Robert thought it was only fair, given that he had vowed to take care of her daughter, not her, but still had done so, even building a wing for her from the time Rufus Clement had died seven years before. 
He knew that Pearl had the money to share the household expenses from Clement's pension and estate. And besides, Robert said, I had given her anything she wanted. They could come to no agreement, and matters only grew worse. The gambler and the socialite were marooned in a house that was big, but not big enough to escape each other. They were the oddest of couples, and each was all that the other had. Day after day, he went to his office, hoping to avoid her on the way out. Day after day, she was stuck in the house where every lamp and figurine reminded her of the daughter she had lost. She had never wanted to be part of the Great Migration or come out to California. She had lived her whole life in the South and was in Los Angeles only because her daughter's husband had been so insistent on fleeing the South and had taken Alice and the girls with him. Now, with Alice gone, she was alone in a city she had never wanted to be in. She had little to fill the hours. Robert and Pearl ground through their days in slow motion and tried to pretend the other wasn't there. It wasn't long until she realized she couldn't take it anymore. She could no longer hold in the resentment. One day, she broke the silence. Why did you have to be the one to live and not my daughter, she finally said. She had gotten it out, and there was nothing left to say after that. The tension had likely been building up from the moment they'd met. Her time in the house couldn't last much longer. She packed her belongings and moved back to Kentucky, where her late husband and daughter were buried. And Robert was alone in the house and with himself for the first time in his life. Chicago, February 1975. Ida Mae Brandon Gladney. Ida Mae's sister Irene, the one who had urged Ida Mae to come north in the first place, saying, I just wouldn't stay down there if I was you, and whom they moved in with upon arrival, was having eye surgery. She hoped Ida Mae would come up to Milwaukee to help her while she recovered. Ida Mae wanted to go, but wasn't sure she would be able to. There was so much going on in Ida Mae's household, with everybody either coming or going to work and trying to take care of the grandkids, who were teenagers now, and get to church on time and pay the light bill and the house note. Ida Mae couldn't drive and didn't have a way to get there. And it was the darkest days of winter. George and Ida Mae were not the youthful innocents fleeing the hard soil of the South for Chicago as they had been all those years ago. They were in their sixties now. George was sixty-eight, and Ida Mae was sixty-two. They had lived in Chicago for longer than they had been in Mississippi and were still working, which they had been doing in one form or the other from the time they could pick up a hoe or reach over a wash pot. They had reached the point in life where everyone around them seemed to be succumbing to something. High blood pressure, diabetes, which they called sugar, cancer, stroke, hysterectomies, heart attacks, or some combination of them all. Ida Mae had had to go back to Mississippi some years before to see about her ailing mother. Miss Thini had collapsed from a stroke, and isolated in the country as she was, had lain out in her yard, unable to move, for more than a day until someone happened to pass by on that lonely gravel road and see her. Miss Thini did not live too much longer after that. Ida Mae went down to the funeral in the spring of 1959 and grieved mightily over it, but she had a family of her own to tend to. Ida Mae herself had finally gotten over her fear of hospitals and had the hysterectomy her doctor said she needed. George had an enlarged heart and had already suffered two heart attacks. Each time, the family managed to get him to go to the hospital, but stubborn as he was and disbelieving and suspicious of northern medicine, he wouldn't submit to any surgery or medication upon release, the nitroglycerin or beta blockers that would have been standard at the time. To him, that was just some kind of northern trickery and against his faith in God. He didn't have no medicine, because if he had it, he wouldn't take it, Ida Mae said. He would never believe nothing was wrong with him. He didn't believe in no doctors. Whatever he was feeling, he just said it was indigestion. Once, when he went to the hospital, the triage nurse was asking him about his symptoms. Don't ask so many questions, he told her. Just do something for me and ask questions later. Now her beloved big sister Irene was needing her, and Ida Mae was trying to figure out how to get to her. George told her she should stay home, tend to the family, and go to church. 
But it turned out that a friend named Evelyn happened to be heading to Milwaukee at around the same time, and Ida May's daughter Eleanor told her she should make up her own mind and go see about her sister. Eleanor agreed to go with her. They helped Irene as best they could. When they arrived back in Chicago and pulled up to the house, they knew something was wrong. It was a Sunday, midday, and George's Chevrolet was still parked out front when he should have been at church. Ida May and Eleanor walked into the vestibule. James came right out. He told them George had had another heart attack while Ida May was away. It was the third one her husband had had. It struck him that morning. This time he didn't come back from the hospital. James broke the news to Ida May and Eleanor that George had passed away. They had to pick both of us up off the floor of the vestibule, Ida May said. She thought back to the start of the weekend, how she had chosen to see about her sister instead of staying home, how the night before she left, the cat had slapped her in the face. I should have known then, Ida May said. She remembered George's warning her over and over, Now you work and make your own money, he used to say, because one day I ain't going to be here. She thought about his last heart attack. The doctor said he'd never pull out of another one, she remembered. Even Irene said she knew something was about to happen, although it wasn't clear exactly how. Ida May, I started to tell you to go back home, Irene said after she learned that George had died. James said he had found him. His arm was as hard as this seat. No, I found him, his wife Mary Ann said. No, you didn't, James said. You fell out in the hallway. I should have been there, Ida May said, in one of her rare displays of regret. For forty-five years, she had been the dutiful wife of a hard-working and stoic man, cooking and cleaning after him and obeying him most of the time, like the pastor had said to do. And here, when he needed her, in his last moments on this earth, she wasn't there. She tried to remind herself why she had gone. Eleanor said I was always doing what he said to do, she remembered. She said I should go on up and see about my sister. I ain't saying he'd have lived. George went to a funeral that Saturday. Something told me, I'd have me. You better stay here. You think about these things. She mulled this over in the days after his death. Then Ida May dried her tears and consoled herself with something her husband used to say. He always said the Lord wasn't going to let him suffer, Ida May said. He had suffered enough in his life. He had been a good provider, and he had kept his faith that God, who had delivered them from Mississippi, would look after him in the end. He was right. He was the one who used to open up the church. He had set out his suit, shirt, shoes, and tie well in advance, so he would be ready that Sunday. He died in his sleep, Eleanor said, with his hand over his heart, like somebody had placed it there. New York, 1978. George Swanson Starling. All the sorrows caught up with Inez. There would be scientific and medical explanations for what befell her. But those who knew her could see the storm whirling inside her, which she had tried to suppress, a thousand little heartaches since coming into the world, just as her mother left it, and being hooked now into a marriage born of adolescent love, but mostly of spite. Her churlishness had managed to alienate so many people, perhaps without intending to, but people didn't tend to stay around long enough to figure out the motivation— the one thing she categorically loved most in this life, her firstborn, Gerard, had broken her heart with his addiction. The drugs had turned him into a stranger and stolen her son from her. She would never fully get over it, and as Gerard sank further and by some miracle came out of it only to sink back again, she and George moved further apart. George practically had a second family, distant though he was, now that he had a son by another woman but he stayed in the marriage out of a distorted sense of honor and duty rather than truly wanting to be there, and Inez had to live with that, too. The New World had been a land of milk and honey, of a hard-won measure of freedom and working-class achievements, 
the Harlem brownstone, the insurance policies and certificates of deposit, the upstairs tenants who brought in extra income, the furniture, cars, and appliances, the steady, if monotonous, jobs that impressed the folks back home. But they had come at a steep price. Inez suffered under the weight of her disappointments, and the mirage of what from Florida looked like a well-lived life in the North. By early 1978, the heartaches caught up with her. She was diagnosed with breast cancer and succumbed later that year. Even as her body failed her and she had little time left on this earth, she and George circled each other, could not break through the hurts and recriminations that had built up over the decades since he had grabbed her by the hand and ushered her into the magistrate's office back in Florida to get back at his father. Her passing lent a finality to that error in judgment. They had lived with it but had not been happy, and the marriage ended more sorrowfully than either of them could have imagined that spring day back in Florida in 1939. Los Angeles, 1978. Robert Joseph Pershing Foster. When Alice died, so did the highbrow social theater she and Robert had shared in Los Angeles. Robert would no longer keep open the private salons of the finest department stores to find some heavily beaded gown for Alice. The invitations to this or that black tie function evaporated. The phone didn't ring as much. With Pearl gone back to Kentucky, he had the whole house to himself. Even the office didn't feel the same. What was he raking in all this money for if he couldn't spend it on someone he could show off and brag about? He was going on 60 now, and it was time he started thinking about letting his private practice go and taking a more predictable position at a hospital somewhere. He wouldn't have to worry about managing an office or patients needing him in the middle of the night. He could spend more time out in Vegas or at the track, doing what he wanted to do, what he came out to California for in the first place. He decided to take a staff position at the Veterans Hospital in Brentwood. It would allow him to focus on medicine and his patients, not on rent, utilities, and payroll. It seemed a perfect fit. He was a veteran, after all. His life would now revolve around carpools to the hospital, treating the same kind of people he treated when he was in the Army in Austria, rather like going back in time, and then there were the trips to Vegas whenever he could get away. It was nothing for him to catch a plane to Vegas after work, gamble all night, fly back the next morning, and make it to his office just in time for his first patient. It was a sickness, said Limuary Jordan, who knew him in Monroe and in Los Angeles, and had little patience for him. I know for a fact that here's a man who could make five hundred or six hundred dollars a day in his office back in the seventies, and still had to go and gamble in Vegas, go play his blackjack. He would arrive at the Las Vegas Hilton, and unlike his first trip back in the fifties, would be ushered to one of the best rooms in the house. The room was comp, Robert said. The meals were comp. He was betting so much money, the casino at the Hilton could be assured it would get the cost of them back, and more. Robert would head to the casino and start playing blackjack or the roulette wheel. Mostly blackjack. Of course, there were no clocks or windows. None of the gamblers knew whether it was day or night. It didn't matter to Robert, because he could play for almost 24 hours straight anyway. I don't know when to get up, Robert said. There were times, lots of times, when he lost, in a matter of minutes, more than some people made in three or four years on a fairly decent job. And when he lost... He just kept playing, feeling it in his bones that the next hand, the next game, would be the one to turn things around. He could rise out of the hole and get back in it for hours or days. He could get away with losing great sums of money because the casino knew he was good for it. During one particularly rough stretch, he had a run of good luck and then sudden, heart-stoppingly bad luck. He was betting heavy and winning at first— he got cocky enough to tell the man in the casino cage that he was going to give him 10% of whatever he won. He got to 10000 11000 12000 $13,000, and started attracting the attention of other gamblers around him. Then nothing seemed to go his way. He usually took someone with him, a nurse, a patient, another gambling buddy, to keep track of his winnings, so he could concentrate on his game. 
When he hit it big, whoever was with him could count on getting a few thousand dollars from him to take back to Los Angeles. When he was losing, they sat helpless and watching. His nurse from the office was with him this time. As Robert's fortunes rose and fell by the hundreds with each bet, she started to notice something and tried to bring it to his attention. You know, the nurse began, seems like every time you get to $13,000 you start losing. Not quite the cliffhanger we had uh, a couple weeks ago where we ended with a riot and wondering whether or not uh, there was going to be an on-the-job rape of a black female, but will be interesting to see where we pick back up with uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Pershing Foster and his gambling addiction. If anything special uh, is noted about him getting the $13,000 and then losing it all. Context of white supremacy, the number to dial 760-569-7676. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6. If you have comment on the book, comments, thoughts on the book you would like to share, number one more time, 760-569-7676. And the code <coughs> is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6. If you would like to participate, please do not wait till the last minute. Uh, we should have Mr. Demry for uh, female caller. I forgive uh, the handle used uh, should be with us as well. I'll get other other folks if they have anything to share. I'll look out for hands as well. Uh, Joe, have anything you want to share uh, related to the second portion that we just heard? Yes, can you hear it? <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Um, what stood out to me was uh, I want to get back to the beginning. Uh, when they, uh, you know, we had already covered, they closed the schools, the Prince Edward County. <clears throat> uh, rather than integrate. And I wanted to mention that uh, in the ruling, uh, the 54 ruling, it had a little statement there about, um, see how did they word it, how soon the integration should take place. And then she said that uh, that meant when they got around to it, you know, they didn't specify exactly a time period, you know, so there was a lot of, uh, feeling around before the, uh, with deliberate speed. And then, <clears throat> uh, the South translated that loosely as whenever they got around to it. And then, Certain counties uh, took longer than others, you know, certain states. Then we had our, uh, oh, I wanted to mention about the, uh, the black principal that was demoted from principal of the color school and then made assistant. You know, you know it, it always amazes me how the same thing happens, you know, it's, it's kind of uniformly in every state, every county, every district. The same thing happened in our particular district. When we first integrated, we had a black principal in our high school, and he had more education than the white principal. He had a master's degree. The uh, white principal only had a bachelor's. And so when we integrated, the black principal wanted the principal job. Well, they didn't give it to him. He took it to court, and white right man's listed, you know, Bassett versus uh, Atlanta High School. 
anyway, it went on for several years. He actually, uh, well, in a way, I say won. He didn't really win, but they were going to make him principal of the junior high school. Well, he stuck with his guns. He wanted to be principal of the high school. So he appealed it, and, of course, he lost in the long run. And then he went home, and he sat at home for the remainder of his life. You know, and he was an example to the rest of us. You know, I had mixed feelings about it. I thought that maybe he probably could have served, you know, the student body, you know, to some degree if he had accepted, you know. But, you know. What can you say? He, yeah, each person has to, uh, you know, make their own decisions concerning who's the principal of the thing. And he chose his decision. And, you know, that's the way that it went. But anyway, um, Walter Irving, uh, another person that, you know, we probably didn't know about. You know, in his thousands, countless, uh, individuals that was in prison falsely and at some point maybe DNA or some evidence that wasn't permitted uh, got them released. But what's strange, well not strange, but what is peculiar about this particular case was that, you know, they said as long as he didn't come back to that county, they released him. And then within a few days, he died on his front porch. That's pretty suspicious. And so, you know, we know that uh, the supremacists probably had something to do with his demise. And um, this uh, Willis McCall, you know, he's getting into my crawl. You know, I, I, I really can't stand this guy. And, you know, it seems like somebody should have did the world a favor on this guy, but uh, he keeps popping up. And, you know, I thought Bull Connors and uh, George Wallace were some of the biggest racists during that time, but, you know, I, I guess this guy's name escaped me. But he was one of the major ones. And then just like the the governor uh, that was in uh, the other book that we read, uh, Little Rock. Yeah, Little Rock had a street named after him, and he lived a long life on his own street. You know, it's, it's just sickening. Uh, then we go to uh, Robert, uh, Dr. Foster, uh, the thought that maybe the new high school should be named after his father, you know, which would have been appropriate, but it's uh, too much like right. So the supremacists and their sick sense of humor did not name the new school after him, but named the housing project after him, where he was a type person that, you know, was not, you know, you know, he's the type of person that you wouldn't name a housing project after. He was somebody that carried himself, you know, in a higher regard. But, like I always say, these, these races got a sick sense of humor. So, uh, we had a tragedy happen. Uh, I think we lost George doing this on his third heart attack, and as always, people always think that if they could have been there, then maybe it would have made a difference, but I don't think uh, Ida May's presence would have uh, done any good, and one other thing I want to mention is the health care disparities. These people are dying much too young, you know, in their 50s and early 60s. You know, as a result of the hard life that they lived, and then the uh, uh, health 
care disparities, the lack of uh, adequate medical care and uh, uh, medicine. Okay, I'll, I'll mute my line. Thank you. Very sad chapter indeed with all the deaths, passing of uh, characters. Um, our female caller, uh, anything you want to share? Second portion that we heard. Well, um, I, uh, in this, it's like you said, we don't speak to each other, we don't tell each other anything, and so we have to start all over from scratch for everything. And I, it, it, it's loosely associated when they were talking about when they were talking about going back to their mom low when there were no curbs or anything. I was remembering one of my uncles used to tell me he used to say, "Well, you know, and there was no bridge. We live on the river, but there was no bridge." And he said, "So we would uh, take our horses across." And he said, "You know, white people are so arrogant. I can't tell you how many times." Your uncle and I would just cross on our horse and then watch some white boy try to do what we do and drown. They watched many white people drown trying to cross the river like the black people did. But I, I don't know if this is related, but I just, I, I, just, uh, I just don't think that they have that arrogance does them in. I think their arrogance is a big problem and it's always going to do them in. Plus, I just don't think that they have the affinity for the animals and the farming that my family has. Because it was always the black people who always did all of that. They never did any of that. And I, I just, you know, we, we always give them so much credit, but I can tell them the stories I was told that they never knew anything about farming. They never knew anything about ranching, and they never knew anything about anything. And, and so I, I do take a little exception now that I've been able to see it for myself. These are just not the brilliant people that everyone keeps saying they are. And then there was also the part where they were talking about how they were training the dogs to hate black people. I remember, and this isn't my family, this is me a long time ago in, in California when the boat people were coming over. I was sitting by the pool and this, this Asian woman would come out and she would be terrified. She would be absolutely terrified. She would do this for several days and finally I just talked to her. I said, what is going on with you? And she said, well, the custom people told us not to ever be near any black people because the black people are really different. They don't bathe. They don't comb their hair. You won't understand what they're saying because their English is so different and they become extremely violent. But you haven't been like that. So I just, you know, I, that's it. You haven't been like that. And I was just really shocked to know that the customs people were telling the boat people as they came over all of these lies about African Americans. They were training them to hate African Americans. It just goes on and on and on. And the other thing, you know, it's just while you were talking about Sheriff McCall not taking down his sign for colors only, it crossed my mind for the first time in probably 20 years that the store that's closest to me still has two front doors. And the store that's the next closest to me still has two front doors. And everything in my world still is a part of the segregated South because I live on the other side of the digital divide. So I was like, wow, you know, I go in those doors all the time and I never, just, it just never crosses my mind that I still, that all of these limits of segregation are still there. See, and I think those were the, the only observations that I made. I had to do uh, had to do a double take myself when they were talking about uh, Sheriff McCall and they named the street after him. I was like, wait a minute, is that did I read that accurately? They named the street after him. I was like, of course, it's a system of racism, white supremacy. Why should I be Why should I be surprised about that? It's the same with 
uh, dogs marking their territory. I think racist. They do that all the time. Name the street after them. Name the entire country after them. Formerly Rhodesia in uh, on the continent of Africa. Uh, that's how they get down worldwide. Um, yeah, this was as I said, not the uh, not the happiest book to read. Um, the portion that we started off with, where they were talking about the black assistant principal. I was so glad that they, they got in uh, about Virginia and how uh, they closed the schools in Prince Edward County uh, for five years, uh, as opposed to allowing black students, black children to attend class with uh, white kids. Uh, I was so glad that they included that because that's so important. And just what they talked about in that portion of the book, I thought that was important as well, because they talked about how white people were either the white white housewives were having to get a job or to give up certain things they were saying they had to give up luxuries and go through all this uh, extra budgeting uh, as a result of the added financial burden whether it was having their child in private school and then they were having to pay tuition for that and everything that they had to go through as a result of that and some of that information uh, we talked about before uh, when we had uh, Mr. was going white male on the program. This is uh, way back end of last year, almost a year ago. And he was talking, uh, he's doing a documentary film on what happened in Virginia uh, and how you had a lot of poor white kids who missed out on school. Their parents couldn't afford to send them to private school. It was a big burden uh, for me. It was another one of those examples. I think we talked about it earlier this week with white people. It is not a big headache. Am I going to practice racism? Am I going to make money? Am I going to do something that will be financially prosperous? Racism, white supremacy always wins. And that this went on for five years. I was really glad she included that uh, information in the book. Um, but also uh, with that, where she was talking, I think she began the second audio segment. She was talking about the black assistant principal and how I guess a fight broke out with a black student and a white student. And he wanted to discipline the black student. And I guess a lot of the black parents or people in the, the town or what have you, they were upset and said, oh, man, you're, you know, you're I think they said you're doing showing reverse favor uh, to the white people. And I just thought, man, I would not have wanted that job at that time uh, for any reason. Uh, being a black person, you're supposed to be. Uh, it's almost like President Obama. Just that seems like one. I'm, I'm thinking of Michael Jackson and the soundtrack for the whiz uh, you can't win like man you are going to be in a tough tough position particularly this is in the south you could you could have probably died at any time if you had done the wrong thing said the wrong thing uh, acted like you are in charge and you're going to discipline a white student uh, i could just imagine what would happen the reaction the wrath of the terrorists white terrorists in the town uh, if you are going the other way and trying to appease the white people, all the black people are going to be upset with you. Just man, I uh, she didn't mention his name, but I was thinking, man, I do not envy this black person <laughs> having to uh, be the assistant black principal uh, at this period in time. Um, let's see. Yeah, with with regards to what happened in Florida, I made a <clears throat> I made a note on that because I think she's given us a lot of great information on the state of Florida with George Starling <clears throat> being in that area and, and just all the terrorism. Dr. Harry T. Moore and his wife, Henrietta, and what they went through um, <clears throat> this portion. It stuck out for me. It says it was talking about when they finally did get rid of Sheriff McCall, when black people were able to vote uh, and they turned out to do so. Uh, oh, and, and even before I move, just skip over this, where he kicked a black prisoner to death. I can't even imagine kicking someone to death, like not with a baton or another weapon or with a gun, but kicking a black person to death. At any rate, uh, when it says in the 70s, when they finally got rid of him and voted him out of office, and she says that <clears throat> then, too, a new generation of whites had entered entered the Florida electorate, the younger people who may have identified with the young freedom riders in Mississippi and Alabama, even if they would not have participated themselves, 
and the snowbirds, the white northerners who were buying up vacation homes or retiring to Central Florida with the boom that came with the arrival of Disney World and who couldn't relate to the heavy handedness of a small town southern sheriff. Uh, that portion right there I highlighted because I think we've pointed out there, I think, are many portions in the book where, at least in my view, <clears throat> it is cutting whites some slack. These white people from the 1970s who I'm guessing if they moved there or whatever the case would be, we're talking 20s, 30s, 40s, a lot of these white people would still be alive. These, I suspect, <clears throat> would be a good number of the white people who are in Florida right now and responsible for the Trayvon Martin murder trial verdict from this past summer, responsible for <clears throat> Stand Your Ground being on the books in Florida anyway, responsible for Marissa Alexander being in greater confinement right now, even though she's supposed to get a new trial, responsible for Trevor Dooley, a black male who attempted to use Stand Your Ground for defending himself against an attacking white man, and they said, oh no, you're going to jail, nigger. These white people, these so-called younger white people who didn't identify with Southern white barbarism in the 1970s, I suspect these are the same people. All of the atrocities, Jordan Davis trial about to come up, these same white people, I suspect many of them are still alive, still in the state of Florida, and we still got the same problem. I could be wrong, but it's just hard for me to imagine that these folks moving down there in the 70s, it hadn't been that long, 30 to 40 years, they would still be around kicking it, doing their thing, and if not them directly, their children, definitely. Um, let's see. Other notes on the second chapter. Yeah, I was glad that was brought up as well. The uh, disparities in healthcare, these people, all of the stress and strain that they experienced, uh, not having access to doctors. I think that was touched on at the very beginning of the book. We were talking about a lot of the black people in the South, even Dr. Robert Pershing Foster not being allowed to practice medicine in the South and then having white doctors who didn't make house calls to black people, etc. Very low life expectancy for black people under the system of racism, white supremacy. Even John Henryism, I just, I was watching a television program and they made a reference to John Henryism. That's what I thought of with uh, uh, Ida Gladney, her husband in Chicago, George, him having three heart attacks and finally succumbing on the third one, that John Henryism having to do all of that uh, and overcoming what they say, working twice as hard. I think they said that explicitly in the text, having to work twice as hard to get half as much uh, produces that sort of thing where you just struggle and strain and just literally work yourself to death uh, through the course of your existence under the system of white supremacy. Um, just real sad all the way around. I, I would even say that might have been responsible for what happened even with Dr. Pershing's uh, wife, Alice. Uh, she seemed to die at a very young age as well. I think 54, uh, if I'm recalling that. I mean, 54. The racism, white supremacy that they had to go through as well. And she grew up in the South. So, uh, yeah, no, I shouldn't say it should not be a surprise, but it is still uh, quite sad. I think I've said that repeatedly. This is not the... Uh, not the happiest book I have read. Uh, any other comments folks want to get in? We should have about 12 minutes left uh, in the broadcast. Anything folks want to get in before we wrap things up? Feel free. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um giving some kind of feedback. Um, you know, I was I noticed that my um, my grandmother's generation, when they were in Chicago, there was a lot of gambling. I remember from when I was very young, there was a lot of gambling with the horse races and, and playing guy and all dice and all this other stuff. And the same thing with my father's generation. There was a lot of gambling. I don't um, I don't see any gambling in, in my generation. I don't see any gambling in the younger generation. But um, she, he talked about going to Vegas all the time. And it's just, uh, I just noticed that there's a change. There's just, there's a huge change. There's just no gambling in the last two generations. Hmm, that is interesting. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if it's completely 
gone or if it has changed forms because I know a lot of people do the online gambling. There's so much of that that can be done with playing poker online and that sort of thing. And I definitely know with the video games, uh, I have seen a lot of young people who are serious about Madden, especially the football video game. And I think it's a couple others where they are very serious uh, about (laughs) being very serious about not being very serious. Uh, I have watched black people that are, I would say they're younger black people that are 25 and under, 30 and under. Uh, Well, they will play $50 per hand on a Madden game, some even higher than that. Uh, so I definitely uh, don't see the the dice and, and cards. I don't see that as much. But I have definitely seen a, a high number of black people who get very serious about certain PlayStation games, certain video games. Uh, and they will drop quite a bit of money uh, gambling, not just buying the material and all that, but gambling, wagering, playing one another for money. I have seen a lot of that. Uh, and I don't know if there are as many black people who do the online poker and all that stuff where you can uh, do do gambling there. But I do know that's big business, so it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. But I definitely don't – I don't see it in the same form that they're talking about in this book. Um, okay. Yeah, that's uh, there. I, oh, okay. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to say something on the gambling. In Chicago – I know right right outside of Chicago now, in uh, East Chicago, and somewhere along the border to uh, Indiana, they have a lot of uh, <clears throat> casino. And just like anything else, uh, it's very hard for a person, uh, an African American. Uh, Mr. Barton, I think, was when he has a casino in the Chicago area, he's the only African American, I think, with a major casino. And he was trying to have one built in Pennsylvania. And he even got uh, Franco Harris, you know, to help him with his uh, PR in order to. Uh, persuade these white people to allow him to uh, bring a casino into that area. But it's just like every other area. There's extreme restriction and requirements that are uh, brought upon African Americans when they attempt to move in in some of these areas, especially gambling. Gambling is a, a very big thing now. Uh, the Indian reservations and, and most all of the states now are voting to have casinos in their particular area. So they are discriminating uh, vastly in order to keep African American entrepreneurs out of the uh, gambling arena. That makes sense. Okay, I think, uh, I think sports too, I think that's another one where I've observed black people do a lot of the Sports gambling, the outcome of football games, basketball games. Um, I think white people do. I think what I know white people do a ton of that, but I think that's something that they've got a lot of black people into as well. That probably wasn't um, like I was saying. Like I, maybe it's changed formats. Maybe I could be incorrect, but um, I know that sports gambling uh, has become really, really big over the last twenty to thirty years. So that might have taken the place of how some of the people were doing some of the gambling before, but I also think that's true as well in terms of keeping black people, making sure that black people don't have opportunities to own casinos and that sort of thing where they are uh, entrepreneurs in that field. I think that that's definitely been big as well. Cause I know there are a lot of casinos in Mississippi and uh, down in the South. And I'm not, I'm not aware that black people are in ownership positions uh, in any of those operations that are down in the South. Like I said, the Mississippi area, 
I think white people uh, dominate that as well as with everything else. White people dominate that as well. Um, yeah, there was a the poem. I, I think she's had a lot of great poems to kind of kick off the chapters, different sections of the book and the poem losses. I uh, just thought it was right on point. Uh, this is by Jacqueline. Joan Johnson. Uh, She migrated from South Carolina to New York in the 1970s, and she said, it occurred to me that no matter where I lived, geography could not save me. And I just thought, wow, that is profound, succinct, right to the point. Uh, And that is painfully accurate. Uh, If you are a non-white person, black person, victim of racism, geography is not going to save you from white terrorism painfully accurate but I thought that was a great poem to to uh, make sure she got in as we're getting uh, down the home stretch in the book yeah I think with uh, Dr. Pershing Foster I think his gambling I think uh, it's Seems to be the same thing. It seems like a lot of, of compensating, um, going to Vegas and going to the flashy hotels. And even if you lose, to be able to say, hey, I lost $13,000, I lost $15,000 uh, in Vegas over the weekend, it seems like that's something else you could show off about. I think they were saying that he, he could go to Vegas and he could lose as much money as some black people would make in three or four years, like even that. And I've, I've seen that behavior from others who gamble being able to say that you lost all this money uh, that other people don't make that in a year or don't make that, you know, five or six months working like that's that's almost like a badge of honor. Like, see, you know, you know, you 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 broke niggas don't make that in a month. You know, I can go in and lose more money than you'll see this year, uh, even if you don't win. It just it seems like another one of those from his complex. I would say the complex is racism, white supremacy. I know he listed about 15 of them that he said he suffered from. But I think that the complex of racism, white supremacy, uh, color complexion, that I think was promoting a lot of his responses, the conspicuous consumption, the gambling, and uh, just all of that, having the quote unquote high lifestyle and having this really opulent house and all this stuff that you couldn't pronounce. And uh, it just wasn't, I think even it was, it was right sad after his wife died and his children were gone and uh, his mother-in-law moves out and they have a really bitter relationship. And then he he has nothing, you know, he's just there in this big house by himself and just, I go to work, go gamble, go work, go gamble. Like that just, uh, I mean, that's to me, that just seems like a really, really empty existence, uh, which is exactly what the system of white supremacy wants to produce. You know, you I know. ordered my, um, go ahead. I, I just curious. I, I ordered my news for COSA, but it hasn't arrived yet because I'm in the middle of nowhere. And um, do we say white identified on the cow? I do, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Dr. Pershing is no different from my father. He's exactly like my father. I don't know where that comes from. It is so white identified. It's like I can't be white. I can't go where you go. But look, I'm behaving exactly as you behave. I don't know where that comes from. I w- I was going to make a point that <clears throat> with all the uh, uh, obstacles that uh, is put in our way, we have the lowest paying jobs, uh, uh, poor housing, poor education, and then uh, deep in our psyche, we still as uh, non-white black people, you know, strive to succeed in a system that is designed for us to fail. And then if we don't succeed, then we're harder on ourselves and each other than we should be because the debt was stacked against us in the first place. And I don't think that... uh, 
with all the with the prisons for the stop and frisk. The police are stopping you, throwing you in prison. You get a strikes against you. Uh, the one guy that was stumped to death, that was a $26 traffic violation. You know, in the book, Willis McCall stumped the prisoner to death on a $26 traffic ticket. I'm just saying, you know, we should give ourselves a break. If, if you have a decent limit, you know, where you are, can eat and you have a job, I mean, we should all be categorized as successful in a system that's designed in the way this one is for us to fail. Well, I, I was saying that my, you know, that he, he was a success. He could just never appreciate that. I mean, he just never saw it. It was all of the superficial glitz, but he was a success. He was a perfect, just like Dr. Pershing, he was a perfect success. And what makes us not appreciate our success? I think that's I think that's one of the core elements of the system of white supremacy. And really, I think I think it goes back what you were saying before about your parents not talking about how we've been mistreated. Uh, this system, it does so much to annihilate our sense of self-worth, uh, sense of self-esteem. Even Kanye West was talking about that. He would be another one uh, who's made all this money and won <clears throat> Grammys and done pretty much anything you could do. Uh, musically, millions upon millions of albums, and he's still upset. Why? Even though he says classism, racism, white supremacy, uh, being a black person, being mistreated, uh, and even when you are a doctor and you're successful, uh, those insults, those jabs, just everything that the system does to undermine you. Dr. Foster and all the, the work he had to go through trying to get a house, uh, all the embarrassments and slights, I think you just, you never get over that. Uh, the incident that we talked about where he tried to get a hotel room when he first moved out to California and he couldn't get a room. Housing situation, I think, when he was trying to move his family out, he got a house and then mysteriously the white person told, oh, I, I sold that to someone else. It's not available. Just all of that, I think, it, it just it builds up to where you just have this sense of deficit to how where I just don't measure up. I'm just not sure if I measure up. Even if you, you've got all this, you've accomplished all this, just... It's nagging because it's already there and you've accumulated so many of those insults and terrorism and abuse. And then it's not just you seeing that happen to so many other black people, every other black person, really uh, having them go all through. I just it has a huge impact, the psychological damage, <clears throat> the psychological terrorism that we experience uh, in this system. It, it does so much to warp. The way that we see black people, including and especially ourselves, which I think it just it drives so much of our behavior with regards to not valuing ourselves, not valuing each other, <clears throat> needing, feeling like we got to have all this other stuff uh, so that we will be valuable, whether it's clothes, money, cars, lots of girls, lots of sexual conquests. Whatever the case may be, I think the system just drives all of that, uh, that there's something wrong with us. Uh, we are not correct. We're not worthy. We're not of value. And we tend to get those reminders on a regular basis. Uh, white people tend to remind us that we just do, regardless of what your degree is, what your type. I think you can even look at President Obama and the way that he's mistreated on a constant basis. They just had an article in The Washington Post talking about white people. And I mean, he's graduated from Harvard, president of the United States, <laughs> another one. How many accolades do you have to have before you stop being a nigger? And the answer seems to be doesn't matter. You're going to be a nigger regardless. And I think that just gnaws away uh, at our psyche for most of us. Uh, and it just unless we're willing to confront that and be honest about that, uh, I think it just it drives a lot of those pathological uh, responses that we've been reading about in this book and observing in ourselves and other family and friends that we know of. I think uh, I think that's what's that's what that what's at the core of it. Um, white identification, as you said, at any rate, we did our uh, three hours uh, 
enjoyed the dialogue in the section. I feel like I have learned a lot from this book. It has a lot of great information. I feel like it's uh, almost like a history book. Uh, it is a history book, I feel like, getting so much, so many uh, details about all these characters and, and this period of time. Uh, but we are nearing the end. I think it uh, should be a max of two more sessions, and we will be all done moving on to the next book. Uh, but we'll be back next uh, Friday. Uh, I think that would be session number 14, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, tomorrow, compensatory call-in, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Pacific. Definitely tune in, uh, talking about workplace racism and incidents, uh, latest news, current events from the last seven days. Uh, definitely tune in, participate tomorrow evening. Uh, we were supposed to have a program on Sunday, but I think uh, I'm still waiting on the book. We're supposed to be having a black professor. Uh, she has a white parent, and she wrote a book about her views on racism having a white parent, but I'm still waiting on the book, so I think we're going to have to postpone that until uh, next week, but uh, we will have Jane Elliott, Admitted Racist. She'll be with us this Monday, her fourth visit. She did the Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise uh, many years ago. She's still giving talks, charging thousands of dollars to talk about racism. Uh, she'll be with us Monday evening, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. So stay tuned. We should be active for the month of October. Uh, still fundraising. Uh, our goal, $1,000 for the month. Uh, invest if you think the program is constructive. Racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com racism dash notes dot blogspot dot com paypal is in the top right corner listener supported invest if you think the program is constructive uh, you can also hit the wish list at amazon dot com uh, it's under gus t renegade uh, you can go there view the wish list uh, books uh, and other constructive items uh, to help out with the cows broadcast Thanks all for participating. I uh, hope it was a constructive investment of your Friday evening, and we will be back soon. Uh, anybody want to do the prayer to wrap things up? I can do it. Right on. Thank you all. It was grand hearing from our callers. Uh, hopefully folks will tune in uh, next week if you are learning and finding some value in Miss Wilkerson's book. Two more to go. Two more to go. Stay warm and safe for the weekend. Be constructive and uh, keep that antenna up. No time to be uh, not vigilant and observant with what's happening around you. Paying attention and not taking anything for granted. Been seeing a lot of terroristic acts and even hearing from listeners. Lots of things going down uh, that they're seeing. So just have that antenna up. We are at war. Cannot, cannot, cannot be lazy and not paying attention to what's happening around you. Thanks for tuning in. Take it away, Mr. Demery Ford. Yes, Creator, we come to you as your sons and daughters. <clears throat> we ask you in the spirit of the ancestors, if you would help us to not pray accept from those who are most determined to hold it from us. We ask that you help us with any complex that we may have, inferiority complexes, superiority complex, any of the pathological symptoms that we may have taken on from living in a system of white supremacy. We ask that you strengthen us and enlighten our mind that we may come up with the answer that we may one day produce justice and no longer have to live in a system of white supremacy. Ashe. Ashe. Context of white supremacy. Signing out. Thank you all for tuning in. I'm a victim, no brother. Problem. A victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.